if today you purchase your membership uh, for $65, uh, we are going to enter you in a raffle for a uh, one $250 voucher that will go to one lucky winner that purchases a membership today. And that voucher will be able to be used with any of our AMM artists. So uh, we have more artists that uh, are a part of the Abbey Museum Indian Market. We cannot feature them all today. If you go to our website and check out the Abbey Museum Indian Market artist profiles, the winner of the raffle for this $250 will be able to choose the artist and to be able to choose how they spend uh, that voucher with the artist. So it's very very exciting. We're looking to see if we can increase our membership. Also, some of the benefits that come with membership, just so you know, free admission to the museum, of course, both sites, the Sturdemont site, as well as the downtown location, and 10% off all items in the gift shop. And uh, also free admission uh, to uh, Smithsonian, uh, yeah, sorry, you get Smithsonian membership, you get First American Art Magazine subscription. Uh, so there's lots to go with membership and also invitations to events that, and other uh, 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 special uh, events that we'll have for members coming up in the future when we get back to live and in-person uh, programming. Coming up this hour, we're going to be beginning with uh, a welcome performance from artist Rolf Richter. He's a flute player from the Passamaquoddy tribe, somebody I'd known ever since my uh, high school days. Uh, Rolf and I sang with the Red Dawn singers way back when we were teenagers, and uh, he has really taken his art, you know, and it's really something that is a true expression of himself. Rolf is a very humble individual, and I will, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, put him out there that he is actually a tremendous talent and somebody that more of us should be seeing. And so we're happy that Rolf was able to join us so that you can take part in his talent here today. Also in the first hour, we're going to be featuring two artists, Barry Dana, very well known here in the state of Maine. Uh, Barry Dana is a Penobscot uh, artist who uh, works with birch bark, but also other mediums as well. And Berta Helis Welch will be joining us today. She's a jeweler. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, Berta is a returning artist from Digital AMM 2020, Barry took part in the Native American Festival and is also a regular here at the Abbey Museum Indian Market. So lots to look forward to, ladies and gentlemen. So performance is going live next. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, here is Rolf Richter with our opening welcome performance. Hello, my name is Rolf Richter. I'm of the Passamaquoddy tribe here in Pleasant Point, Maine, and I play and make Native American flutes. And what I'm going to be doing for you today is just simply playing some flute music, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, one thing I like to encourage people to do when they're listening to this kind of music is just simply close your eyes and let it take you away. Let it make you become a part of the story. So without further ado, let's get started.
that was on a flute that I had made some time ago. Uh, this one was made by a friend and it has a much deeper tone. This particular flute was made by one of my favorite makers. His name is J.P. Gomez, and it is a beautiful sounding flute. But aren't they all?
the absolute most wonderful thing about these instruments is that they take you away to another world and I highly encourage you to pick one up or just keep listening okay this final song is on a flute made out of a beautiful wood called tiger maple and it was made uh, from another great flute maker named Dana Ross. And here we go. All right, Willie Wynn, Rolf Richter. Oh my goodness, I told you. Uh, he's a very humble individual, but extremely talented. And uh, we're so glad uh, it was it was kind of an effort, you know, to, to get Rolf here this year. Uh, he wasn't feeling well and still delivered, you know, just beautiful music. Thank you so much, Rolf. Oh, my goodness. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving along with our program. We're going to be featuring our first artist and uh, probably one of the most popular ones as we uh, uh, push the names out of uh, who is going to be a part of Digital AMIM this year. Got the most response very quickly uh mr barry dana from the penobscot nation is going to be joining us here in just a moment barry is uh known for his um birch bark basketry of course he's a very high level birch bark basketry artist uh has been working with the material made canoes uh made wigwams you name it uh you know and and knows the material uh inside and out and is really that's the older material for basket making the the, the more uh ancient material uh, that our ancestors learned to use in multiple different ways. And, and Barry is such a, a, a well-learned scholar on uh, the art of using birch bark in various different ways. But he's also, uh, he works in, in different uh, mediums of artistry as well. So Barry, I see that you've joined us here. Welcome, Barry. Nice to see you. Oh, my pleasure. My honor. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So I was just giving everybody a little bit of rundown on uh, who you are, you know, and most folks here in the state of Maine, of course, know you. But uh, for those that, that may not, that may be tuning in from far away, I wonder if you can give everybody a, a quick introduction of yourself and what you do. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, before I start, though, that was uh, I appreciated that opening with Rolf. That was very meditative. That that set me in the right frame of mind to um as you say, you know, like go deeper into who you are and kind of a more of a spiritual way of um, expressing ourselves. That, that, that's just, there's no better way to do it than, than that type of music. So I have Rolf C Rolf CD in my, when I travel, he, he's my traveling companion. So I'm Barry Daner. I'm from the Penobscot Nation, Butterwup Skiwiug. Um, 
And I was raised on the uh, reservation. So I grew up as one of the kids running the res, um, playing hide and go seek, chasing one another and tackle football, playing out on the ice, you know, going up, getting Christmas trees and four feet of snow. I mean, you name it. Um, when I was a kid, I hung out with the elders. It was, it was kind of odd, but um, there were certain elders that made themselves available to kids. That we, we would just go and sit in their presence. They would carve. They would, be pre pre they would maybe pre preparing medicines, tanning a hide or whatever they were doing and uh, making baskets. And we would just hang out with them. So I spent a lot of time uh, being raised, if you will, in the ways that I think and my, my perspective on life uh, by Native elders, primarily my grandmother and my mother. So a lot of um, what I have to share is from not only my perspective, but the perspective that I was raised with. So, and I think that's really, you know, people like your dad, Wayne Newell, I mean, what a mentor. I would visit, I would sit with him for hours on it as he um, was more than willing to share his wisdom and knowledge. So that's, that's who I am. I'm native. I'm native at heart, mind and soul and spirit. So um, for me to feel like I'm living, I have to be doing something of a native um, tradition. I got into basket making, not as a basket maker and not as an artist, but as a um, means to preserve Penobscot culture. It wasn't an effort to try to um, compete with the ash basket. That was well underway. It's been really well preserved. So there was no need for me. You know, I was taught basketry by an elder, but it was ash basketry. And she said, as long as you can make baskets, you'll make money. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's good. But um, there was something about the birch bark that attracted my interest. I mean, it is in my view, uh, from having studied our culture and traditions, it, it's, it's the number one uh, material that we gather from nature that provides for us. Without birch bark, we didn't have our homes, we didn't have transportation, we didn't have medicines. We had, well, medicines we needed birch for. It's very specific what birch provides for us as a medicine. Um, and, it, and it's just a host of many things, even even goggles in the winter to keep us from getting snow blindness. I mean, there's so much that the birch does for us. So I wanted to become a canoe maker. And I tried my best to just go out and make a birch bark canoe with no knowledge thereof. And uh, well, that first canoe never saw the water. It actually saw my wood stove. <laughs> So I spent the next year really studying it better. Um, I traveled to New Hampshire and sat with a canoe maker and I got a really good idea. So I made a canoe and I did it with six Penobscot youth. And we, we made that canoe. We had a grand launching. The elders and the community came out and they were so taken with the fact that here it is. We have a birch bark canoe. It was kind of homely, <laughs> but it, would, it worked really well. If for some reason it floated and we actually moved it along really nice. So getting into birch in that manner, you know, really got me looking at what else do we do with birch? And um, I would also teach native skills to people in five day outings. So we take people out of nature, we teach them the plants for food and medicine, we teach them how to make shelters, how to make fire without matches, so many different things. Well, part of that is um, you have to feed them and what we really like to feed for supper is moose stew. Well, you have to have a receptacle to eat moose stew out of. And if you make the right, if you do it right, it doesn't leak on your shirt. <laughs> so we fold up bark. We put a, you don't need a rim on it at all. The baskets you see here all have rims just, and um, they need rims. But this particular style of basket we made was a bowl and you you clamp it on the two ends and you have a, a watertight bowl. Uh, but you have to be good at folding. You have to be good at tactile skills when you're working with bark and roots. So I taught people how to make bowls out of birch bark. And 
I got an invitation from the Maine Indian Basket Alliance to show my baskets. And I thought, I'm not a basket maker. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate this offer. That's great. But my wife says, well, you make the bowls. Just take some bowls with you. I said, I know, but they're homely. You know, they, they got moose stew in them. <laughs> so um, I put rims on those bowls and put sweet grass on the top and uh, laced them up with spruce root, made them look a little more presentable. And I think I took seven to that first show and all seven sold. And I said, all right, that, that was cool. I like this. Uh, and what I really liked also was being with all the, the Wabanaki artists, shoulder to shoulder basically, and chatting, getting caught up with people I hadn't seen for a long time. It was really enriching. I really liked it and been doing it ever since. So pandemic has put that off for a year and i'm really hoping to get back into that because i miss the people uh and the shows are really you know they're fun to be at uh, um, you get to make a little bit of money if you sell a basket so I'll, I'll i'll end this little tiny segment by saying the purpose for me making baskets is to use first of all is to revive old traditions keep them alive and well, because I think it's our, our ancestors smile when they see us um, actively continuing old ways. And I think um, birch bark is one of those things that kind of got left to the side a little bit. Uh, I think all, all we were doing for a long time was making trinkets, you know, little picture frames for, you know, and little tiny canoes People ask me, can you make me a little model canoe? And I said, no, I make real canoes. And that's the way I'm going to do it. I can make real baskets too. So if you want a basket, that's fine. Um, and that is, you know, I, I want to keep the tradition alive because it keeps us alive. And I think that's, you know, when, when Native people see each other doing the, our art, it, it's really uh, validating to as to who we are. That's such a... <laughs> Oh, there we go. So that, that was such a, a beautiful journey. You know, the, the story that you tell of, you know, how this this came about. And and for, for those that don't know, and, and uh, for the past McQuaddies, one of our most revered artists is Toma Joseph, who was a birch bark mm. artist and also did etchings. And, and we have pieces of his art here at the collections. We got pieces of Barry's art here at the collections at the Abbey Museum as well. And that's we're actually showing you a slideshow of some of the pieces that we do have here. Uh, and so we, we thank Barry. Uh, you know, he's been such a great supporter and of course, we uh, at the Abbey, we, we constantly want to make sure that people understand that our arts are not something that are just something that exists in the past, but they are living. And you are a prime example of how that that carries on through a lineage and, and goes on to the next generation. It's beautiful what you create. It really is. Um, now, this is something that you don't talk about much, but you do uh, work in other mediums of artistry. And uh, before we get to uh, questions from the audience, uh, and by the way, uh, for folks, uh, you can uh, visit Barry's artist profile. You can see it in the chat. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to pop them in the comments or in the Q&A, and uh, we can interact with Barry a little bit here. Uh, but uh, I wanted Barry to just talk a little bit more. I mean, he does so many things. Uh, you know, there's the as I could list off a dictionary of, uh, you know, accomplishments and things that Barry does in his life that are just outstanding uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, he's also doing a run, by the way, uh, a 24 hour run. And I don't know if he wants to t plug that a little bit uh, because uh, um, uh, it's it's for a very, very good uh, um, cause for sure. Um, but uh, he also works in other mediums uh, of two dimensional art like painting. And uh, I wonder if you might talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think I appreciate that. And thanks for the plug. Um, it's a it's a 24 hour run. And I'm donating that time. And of course, it costs me money to join that event. Um, it's a uh, it's a race that, that other people do. And I won't be racing. I'll be but I will be running as many miles as I can hoping people donate a, a dollar amount per mile. So it's for Bomazine Land Trust. It's a brand new Wabanaki nonprofit with the goals of uh, attaining ancestral lands and to, to host on those lands um, sustainable living. Uh, it's, it's put together by a group of young Wabanaki people and they are outstanding. 
uh, with, with their talents. And I'm very honored to represent them in this effort to get, get our lands back. We've all heard of land back. These kids are doing it. I call them kids. One's my daughter. That's the way it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, before I show you the, um, the paintings behind me, I, I want to show you if the camera picks it up. Just one more basket I did. Yep. It looks yeah, good. We can see it. All right. Yeah. So um, you can see that in my, in my basketry, uh, I'm doing the etchings and etchings are drawings of uh and they're two-dimensional and they're you cannot make a mistake because you're taking bark off you can't put it back on <laughs> um, with two-dimensional painting however i can make all the mistakes in the world let it dry and i can fix it so let me just show you some of the paintings that i do uh, i grew up on the reservation and and uh, and it, there were many people that loved painting i sat with uh Two brothers, um, Sanabe and his brother, Jerry Francis, they were two-dimensional oil painters. And, you know, they could make anything look beautiful. And they would talk to me about making something look far away if it's far away. How do you do that? So the little in intricacies. Sanabe actually studied in Europe with some of the masters. So, you know, they, they it, it, it stayed with me. So I'm going to, I got them behind me and I'm going to see if we can, I'll show you them right now. So these are oil paintings. This one's not for sale, but it, sh it shows my lifestyle. Growing the three sisters, my wife and daughter, and the fact that we live in nature. So my, my oil paintings are inspired by my lifestyle. I did this one a long time ago. This something really not right about the lighting but so again i found this skull when i was paddling madame Moscona stream and i couldn't wait to get it home and paint it so again that's not for sale either Landscapes. This is out behind our camp in Alder Stream. There's uh, too much light in this room. It's, it's just not doing very well. It's coming it's through pretty good, good on our end. Oh, okay. Okay. It looks really washed out. But I like to get right into my goal isn't to make, you know, absolute realism. I want you to get a sense of nature. We know as we know as Wabanaki people, nature, we don't live without it. So even though I have a bridge in this, which is a man-made colonized structure, uh, it's it's the way we live today. So but I wanted to capture that water running under the bridge. This here is I like to do things right out of my mind too. You know, I just put this together more as from you know my my memory of nature so i spend a lot of time out in the in the winter we go snowshoeing and i run a dog team and you know i want to i want to capture nature and then the last one is definitely for sale I don't know if you can see that good. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. All right. And of course, you know, this is our sacred mountain. Yeah. So this was the picture itself that I went by was taken on our annual Katahdin 100, where we go 100 miles from Indian Island up to the mountain. And in this particular one, um, the river was really low, so we didn't dare to take our canoe. So we actually hiked the last 100 miles of the Appalachian Trail. And this is just a few, mi few miles from the finish. We camped overnight and got up early in the morning and hit the trail again and took this picture. So I said, I can't wait to get home and do that painting. If anybody was interested in this painting, uh, it goes for 2000. So um, it's a uh, 26 by 
24 by 36 inch oil on canvas. And the, the oil painting is something I want to get better at. Um, it's really, really, I'm having fun with it. So <laughs> and I don't have bark. I can, I can go painting. Yeah, it's yeah, beautiful, it's beautiful, beautiful work. We do have one question before we're going to move on to our next artist. And thank you so much for uh, showing your 2D art. You know, once again, it varies so well known for the birch bark art, but uh, is multi-talented. Uh, but we did get a question about birch bark art uh, from uh, one of our viewers. If someone were encountering birch bark art for the first time, what would be the most important things you'd want them to understand about the practice, the art form? Art follows function. The art that we etch on the outside of the basket, first of all, the bark is turned inside out. So when we look at a birch tree, we see white, but the inside is um, brown. And if you gather that bark in the spring, early spring, it's called winter bark, it's still snow on the ground. So that'll, that gives us the uh, ability to do the etching. The... To me, when I have a finished basket, it's almost like an empty canvas. It gives me something to create art from. So the, the, the actual making of the basket is an art form in itself, but the, but the etching becomes that, that additional art, but it's not needed. <laughs> There's so much in native art from east to west, north to south, all over Turtle Island, where we, we want to bring to a visual representation of that which is important to us. So you see the animals, you see the plants, you see you know the mountains, you see ancestors. Um, so I think that art in terms of its function is for the artists to be able to express you know uh, how we feel about preserving culture. So these baskets here, they're all for storing food. That's their function. I don't have to do the artwork on them, but in today's times, you know, no one's gonna buy these so they can store their dried squash or dried moose meat or deer meat or dried fish. Um, but they are functional in terms of art now. So they all have a function. I think that would be my first lesson. And that's an excellent way for us to end. Thank you so much, Barry. We, we appreciate you so much here at the Abbey. We appreciate your time here and telling your story. And uh, before we move on to our next artist, I'll give you the chance to sign yourself off. Okay, well, um, G. Willie And thank you very much for this time. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, in person. Aha, uh up, -huh. Judge. Aha, up, Judge. Me not. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Barry Dana, so much for that time. We are going to be moving on to our next featured artist for this hour, Berta Helis Welch, Aquina Wampanoag. She was with us here last year, such a light of a person, and uh, we're getting her loaded up right now. We're going to be turning it over here to Berta to introduce herself and her artwork once again to you all. And uh, also, we will encourage you as you're watching Berta uh, to uh, interact with us. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A and uh, also put them in the Facebook comments. And we will be having some Q&A with Berta shortly after her presentation here. So Berta, it looks like you're here with us. How are you? Oh, we don't hear you. You're on mute. There. Yeah. Hi, the how are you? So I'm going to turn it right over to you, Berta Helis Welch from the Quinn Wampanoag. Good to see you again this year. Me too. Thank you. I wanted to share with you a story of how we Aquino people came to Naopi, Martha's Vineyard. Our oral history tells us how we came to Naopi. Our great leader, Masha, taller than any man, posed supernatural powers and his great strength often attributed to his strong medicine. Masha led his tribe uh, to new lands. He knew that, that uh, 
the foreigners were coming and um, he wanted to move his family uh, to safety. And so he walked for many, many, many miles. And as he got tired, he uh, dragged his toe, which created an inlet in the mossy land where the ocean came in and thus separating us from the mainland, creating the island of Naopi. It was a beautiful place filled with plenty of food, berries, seafood, rabbit, fox, deer. We had everything. Moshup was so big and strong, he could wade through the waters and catch a whale with his bare hands. And that is how he continued to provide for his people. Life was good for many, many years. Uh, Mashup soon became to have uh, visions of, of the people coming again, the foreigners coming again, um, people who spoke strange language, who came on cakes of ice, who had different types of animals, barking animals. And he told his people that he feared that there would be no more room for his people on Naopi. He gave his children an option to become whales. Many did, but of course, some of us did not, and we remained here. There's evidence still of Moshup and his love for his people. Um, the black clay from our cliffs is from the whales, uh, putans, that he would uh, provide for the people, the fires for, for cooking the whales. Um, the red clay from the slaughtering of the whales. Uh, his pet was a toad, which he turned into a rock. And later, uh, the Wampanoag people used that toad, the eye of the toad of that rock, for leaving messages for our people. So it became the first uh, post office, so to speak. The fog that still comes in and kisses our cheeks, that's from Masha smoking his pipe. And now I will show you some of my artwork. Um, I want to welcome you um, to a family owned uh, store that my sister and I um, run. Uh, our mother and her sister started it 85 years ago on top of the Gay Head Cliffs here in Aquina. Um, my mom was a, a potter and so she made really beautiful um, clay pots from the Gay Head Cliffs. Uh, she carried other American Indian arts and um, and she and our father, who was a silversmith from Tosco, Mexico, uh, created really beautiful jewelry together. Um, I have been influenced uh, by their work and uh, started working a number of years ago with the Quahog shell and also incorporating um, other stones, oops, stones and shells uh, into uh, my work, which is kind of bringing together the ocean and the land. Um, these are scallop shells. We are uh, still uh, fisher people here, fisher woman. Um, during many winters, we um, harvest uh, fish for bay scallops right here in our town. 
I use a lot of abalone shell and mother of pearl, which really is a nice accent to um, the quahog shell. Um, many people refer to the um, quahog shell as wampum, which true wampum are, are beads um, and have a long um, place of history in the United States before it was the United States. Um, I don't call my work wampum because it is contemporary work. Um, and I um, think that people who make beads and continue to work in that type of um, art uh, should call it wampum. We have a lot of problems here uh, on Nopi, uh, Martha's Vineyard, where uh, non-native people are copying um, both design and our language, um, calling their work wampum. And it's places like the Abbey Museum that really help create and tell the true story. Um, and uh, uh, demonstrate support for, for Native artists. And I want to thank the Abbey for doing that. So that's about the end of my presentation. This is really nice. All right. Thank you so much, Berta. It's cool. so good to see you. I love seeing your pieces. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, as we talked about last year, I got a lot of good friends from Aquina, uh, the Vanderhoop family, among others. And so I spent time there. It's beautiful, beautiful territory. And, uh, you know, uh, it's such a, a blessing to have you with us here today. Um, so we, we got questions coming in. Um, and in, you, in a way, this, uh, this question kind of came early in your presentation. And in some ways, you answered it and also redefined the question a little bit. The question came through as, could you explain my working with wampum is significant to you and why you incorporate it in all your work. But as you mentioned, you don't necessarily call what you do wampum work. Um, you know, so would uh, what would your um, best explanation of your work be? Well, certainly I'm, uh, you know, moved uh, by the actual people who, you know, centuries ago made wampum. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, how they did it without electricity, without uh, metal. Um, and I am in awe of, I'm just so respectful to our ancestors who did that work. Um, so that's why I'm very careful about not throwing around the word wampum. Um, you know, my work is contemporary and um, Quahog Shell, you know, we are so blessed here with um, an abundance of, of Quahog Shell. I mean, if, so. it, if it looks enough like a bear. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things I love to, uh, you know, uh, inform our audiences at the Abbey about is, uh, you know, our art forms are not uh, static, right? They're not only authentic 100 years ago or 500 years ago, but in fact, our cultures have always been dynamic. Our, our previous artist, Barry Daner, talked about, you know, how it changes over time. And, mm -hmm. and absolutely, we need to find the right terminology to go along with it. And we're using the English language to do it, which you know, uh, in some ways, uh, um, it has some failures to it because we're talking, we're talking about traditional art, but it's really the artists that, uh, that, uh, create the language and it's up to us uh, as uh, you, know, uh, you know people that love your art to, to incorporate that language as much as possible and I really appreciate the education that you're giving to everybody here today. Um, we do have another question for you and this is about your running your own shop. Um, can you speak about the experience of managing your own gift and craft shop? How has the 80 year legacy of your family's business shaped you as an artist? Yeah, um, we are so fortunate. Uh, you know, we, I'm uh, a family of four and we all grew up literally behind the showcases of this store. I remember napping, um, we still have the showcase, napping underneath where the tissue paper was. Um, and so our playground was the Gayhead Cliffs and the beaches. So we're, you know, we're so fortunate. But growing up and um, watching our parents who um, purchased uh, American Indian made 
you know, many, many, many years ago um, and really uh, supporting Native artists. And um, they had a very uh, good um, work ethic and that has been trickled down to us. And we feel very fortunate that as Native people, you know, that we have a very good business that we we continue to work hard at even through these times of you know COVID um, last year was really tough and uh, um, this year you know uh, we're survivors right so um, but it's really um, it's 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 been a great job you know if I have to have a job you want to you want to love what you're doing and we do we we love our business and it's a it's such great opportunity to get out in um, the states and meet so many other really great artists and try to support we try to buy as much american indian made as we can yeah and and that legacy i mean uh, so many artists you know have that legacy uh, you know uh, it's, it's not just about business it's about passing along knowledge passing along culture um in the creation of the art you know i hear a lot of the artists describe it as a journey sometimes or even like the making of a song in a way you know so it, it's really more about uh more than about the business it's, it's about who we are uh and and that carrying that legacy and, and and having a successful business is actually part of that in the modern day world um you know so really appreciate bringing all of that you know uh and uh you know the way you support our artists in, in modern day times is by buying their art uh and doing it at the price that they ask you know that's another very important thing you know don't uh uh you know try to uh, uh discount the the you know the the work the actual blood sweat and tears that these artists put into these uh um uh, the items that they make for purchase you know honor them uh by paying full price that's one of the things that we always try to teach as well and uh, i'm sure as a business owner uh you know um uh that's probably had to that have that conversation a few times i would hope that if anybody does contact you that they would understand uh you know you know to respect uh you know the um the, the legacy but also uh the value of what you do beyond uh you know culture and everything but also to make sure that monetarily we're we're compensating our artists properly so really appreciate you being here berta uh we are about to move on to our next artist but before we do i just wanted to give you the last opportunity to uh sign yourself off it was a pleasure having you here as always and for those that would like to see more of berta's art or want to find out how to contact her you can uh click on the uh, her profile in the abbey museum indian market artist profiles on our website and you will find contact information and other samples of Berta's Berta's art there. And with that, Berta, go ahead and sign yourself off. Thank you. Katavatash. All right. Willie one, Berta. So for those that are watching, uh, if you're watching the recording, in this first hour, we opened up with a performance from flute artist Rolf Richter from the Passamaquoddy tribe. And we had our two uh, artist features, our first two artist features, which were Barry Dana, and then followed by Berta Gilas Welch from the Aquina Wampanoag, uh, Barry Dana coming from the Penobscot Nation. So uh, for those watching, you can rewind the hour, go back and watch their segments if those are the artists that you're looking for. Coming up is the top of the hour. We're going to have our first trivia question coming up here in five minutes, ladies and gentlemen. So get yourselves ready. Once again, we're going to be having you, we're going to ask the question. We're going to have you submit your answers, I believe, to educator at abbeymuseum.org. That's the email address that we'll be using for submission of your answers. And from the correct answers, we will be choosing two winners and we'll be notifying those winners by email. So that will be the process for the trivia contest. The first question coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, we also have coming up in the next hour, a uh, storytelling performance from John Dennis. We're going to be including artist features with Francis Sock Toma and the couple uh, known as DeConte and Brown. So uh, we'll be talking with them actually a few times today uh, because uh, one of the, actually both of them were involved with our 
our kickoff party yesterday. Uh, just a reminder that Digital AMM 2021 is sponsored by Lee Auto Malls. Thank you so much to Lee Auto Malls for that ongoing support. And also, folks, remember, uh, we are having a membership drive today. $65 is the cost of membership. It comes with a lot of privileges. And if you purchase a membership today, we are going to enter your name in a raffle for a $200, one $250 gift voucher that you can use to choose any artist in the artist profiles from the Abbey Museum Indian Market and choose to spend that $250 voucher on a piece of art from one of those artists. So you get to support the artist directly and opportunity, exciting opportunity uh, to get a $250 voucher and take home some of this wonderful work that we're seeing here today from either one of our featured artists or one of our other artists, as many more on our artist profiles. Uh, so we are getting up to it, ladies and gentlemen, our trivia question, trivia question that we have for this first hour before we get to John Dennis. The question is, what is the name of the Maliseet chief who participated in the week-long negotiations of the Treaty of Watertown and brought 400 troops to the Battle of Machias? Once again, that question, what is the name of the Maliseet chief who participated in the week-long negotiations of the Treaty of Watertown and brought 400 troops to the Battle of Machias? You can email your answers to educator at abbeymuseum.org. Do so right away. The faster you get your answers in there, if you are right, the more likely you will be chosen as one of the winners. So that is our first trivia question for today. Next up, we have a performance, a storytelling performance from a good buddy of the Abbey Museum. He's one of our Native Council members, John Dennis, coming from the Mi'kmaq Nation all the way up in northern Maine. He is going to be bringing forward some storytelling. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, John Dennis. Uh, my name is John Joseph Dennis, um, I'm uh, from the Mi'kmaq Nation. Um, I grew up in Eskasoni, um, in um, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, but I now reside in Presque Isle. <clears throat> um, when it comes to um, telling stories, uh, the original story sometimes gets um, um, twisted. And so this story is about um, the dancing man. <clears throat> so this story I read from um, one of the um, one of the research books that I, I got into, um, Silas Ran. Um, and it was from the legends of the Micmacs. So the dancing man starts out with a young boy who is about to turn into a man. But this boy has, uh, he's the youngest out of seven, um, seven boys and or seven men. And <clears throat> he's the smallest. And being the smallest, he's always bullied by the oldest um, brother. So this brother would um, push him around and uh, would make him do unnecessary work or, or chores that uh, were deemed uh, you would say um, disrespectful. Um, and one of those chores was ringing out his brother's moccasins. So he would ring out his brother's moccasins after they come from hunting and fishing. So in doing this, it was, uh, it was that was one of his chores, making sure that he took care of his mom and all this because he was the smallest and being the smallest of his brothers, um, he would, um, be given these small chores. Uh, he did not like this. Um, so this young boy, he did not like this, this chore, um, this way of life that he was living. <coughs> so he asked his, his mother, his mom, to, you know, I, I want to do something else with my life. <coughs> Excuse me. So when he asked his, his mom that he wanted to do something with his life, um, 
his mom knew that he was going to leave. And in doing so, she prepared, um, she went in the, out into the woods and prepared, um, I would say like um, a going away gift because she knew that he was leaving. Um, as mothers tend to do, they know they know their children. And so she went out into the woods and started making bow and arrow. And she made many arrows. And in also doing so, she made these magnificence for his for his son. Because you go, um, the thing is, is like you go through many magnificence when you are walking through the woods because he, the letter really wasn't, you know, it's not the greatest, it's, it is what it is. And so with this letter, um, she made many moccasins and these moccasins were, uh, we called muksin. Um, muksin, um, they were magic. And for me, I think that the magic comes from um, her love for her son because he was going away. Um, and she knew this. And so in, go and in making this, she made many moccasins. And so she, when she came back, she gifted the bow and arrow and the moccasins to her son. And he was a little surprised. What is this about? Um, what, what is this? And so she said, well, put on the moccasins and um, shoot the arrow into the air and catch it. And in doing so, he did it. And when he started running, he realized that he could run really fast. And so he would catch the arrow before it would land on the ground. So he kept on doing this. And doing so, um, he, um, he went very far. You know, and, uh, he, he went, uh, in 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 one day, he went quite a distance. To tell you how much of a distance that he went, um, when the brothers had returned, the older brother was mad. He was very upset that um, his younger brother was not there to be bullied by him. And so, going going to this. Um, she, the, the older brother went to go find the younger brother. And in doing so, um, the distance that the little boy traveled, you know, um, the little brother, the, the distance that he traveled in one day, uh, it required or it took around 100 days or so for all of the, the older brothers to really reach that one day destination. And, and so reaching that destination, um, sorry, I have allergies. So that's why I'm sniffling quite a bit. <clears throat> so the so the the brother or the younger brother, young boy, he arrived at his destination. It was getting dark going back to him. Um, and when he got back to his to his place, you know, when he when he reached his uh, he reached the destination at the end of the night, and of course. You know, the old, the, the young boy started making uh, a fire, started getting some, uh, you know, whatever um, animals that were around so that he can um, make something to eat. And so in making himself a little camp, camp and fire and so on, uh, an old man appeared out of the woods, which startled the, the young boy. And so this young old man came up to him and said, may I sit by your fire? And of course, me my custom, go ahead, bossy. He told him, you know, sit down. Come over here and sit down. So the old man sat down and the old man started talking about, um, you know, where he had come from. Because uh, of course, you know, in me and like anywhere else, you ask, tell me, would you, where did you come from, you know? So, so the, um, the old man started talking about where he had come from. And this place that this uh, uh, old man come from, it was, he said, was very beautiful. Everybody was, you know, uh, there was food all the time available. And, 
you know, there was like people were just so happy and content. It was just like, he didn't really want to leave, but he knew that he wanted to go see his sister before he passed on. So he wanted to go and, and just see her one more time, you know? So he was on his way to see his sister. And so this uh, old man, after talking with the, uh, the young boy, they started conversing. After a while, um, the, the young boy realized that this old man's shoes or his moksin, you know, the moccasins that he had on, had holes in them. And so Mi'kmaq custom, you, you give, you know, um, it's hospitality. So he gave one of his moccasins and, and probably one or two more to this old man. And the old man was very, very pleased with this gift. Oh, geez, Walalim, thank you very much, he said. And so <clears throat> after that, um, Mi'kmaq custom, if somebody gives you something, you give them something else in return. And so the, the only thing that he had of value, this old man gave him this medallion that he had on. And it was a box. So he, he gave him a ne necklace with a box. And so when it came to, uh, when he gave it to the, young, to the young boy, he put it on. And of course, he was kind of turned off by it because it had um, a sweaty kind of odor in it. And he was like, thank you very much. You know, um, he was kind of, uh, you would say, put off by it. So after conversing and eating and all this stuff, the old man fell asleep. Now the young boy sat there just thinking, poking at the fire and so on. And he looked down and wanted to see what was actually in the box. So when he opened the box, there was a little man in that box. And so this little man looked at him and said, how can I help you? And so the little boy sat there and he, the young man, the young boy, he sat there and he's like, well, what do you mean? How can I help you? So the dancing man or the little man looked at him and he said, well, anything that you ask, I will do. And so the young boy started thinking. He said, I want to go where this old man came from. I want to go to that village. That, that, that looks like a very nice village and I want to go there. So the man in, in the box started dancing. And as he was dancing, he was singing. And as he was dancing, the young boy started getting sleepy and his eyes were getting heavy. And he fell asleep. As he fell asleep, he could hear the dancing man singing away. <clears throat> when the little boy, when the little boy awoke, he looked around and he did not know any of his surroundings. And as he looked around, he seen people. They were happy and everything. And he was just looking around like, wow, everybody is so prosperous and so joyous and happy here. What is going on? And so the one person that could answer it was the dancing man. And so the dancing man looked at him and he said, How can I help you? And the, the little boy looked at him and he said, Where am I? And so the dancing man told him, Where did you want to go? You said you wanted to go to the village? You're at the village. The dancing man closed the door on the box. So the little boy put the box away. And as he walked around, he was, uh, hi, how are you doing? My name is so-and-so. I'm from here. This is, I'm, my parents are so-and-so. So he's introducing himself to all the people. And as he's doing this, he notices one beautiful, beautiful young lady that just walked by. Now this beauty just caught him at the one corner of his eye. And he, and we've all been there. We've all seen somebody and we were like, wow. And so it, it just caught his heart. It just caught everything. And it's just slowed him in his tracks. And then he started asking, when, 
who is that? Or to ask me, come on, you know, everybody else started pointing with their lips. When that, who is that? You know? <laughs> and so everybody they told him, you know, don't go there. Don't go there. Because that is the chief's daughter. He does not like anybody seeing his daughter. And so as he walked around, um, there is only one person that told him um, where the chief lived. And so he wanted to go see the chief. And this old woman, and of course we know this woman because this woman is in every, every um, community preservation or whatever that you want to call her. She does not have a filter. She will tell you every, anything that you want to know. So she tells him, the chief lives over there. The wigwam with all the antlers on, that's where he lives. And so a little boy went, the young boy went over to, to where the wigwam was with all the antlers. And as he was uh, looking, you know, looking around, he um, knocked on, a, I guess, knocked on the poles, you know, Bisquadas, can I come in? And a voice from inside the wigwam told him, Bisqua, come on in. So he opened the door. And when he came in, he sat. When you come in, you sit to the side. You know, you sit right by the door. So he sat right by the door. And he explained why he was there. First, he told him, they told the chief his name, told the chief whose parents were, told the chief of where he, he came from and why he was there. And so after explaining all of this, the chief told him, Abjilasi, come sit closer to me. And so the boy sat closer to him. And as they were talking, he said, uh, the chief sat there and he was very curious. Why do you want to marry my daughter? What is it that makes you think that you are he would be the perfect man to take care of my daughter because that is obviously every uh, every father's idea ideal uh, person for their daughter is somebody that will take care of them so the young boy started thinking and he said well you know I, she is and would be my life you know because my life and my love would be will be hers, and so the young, the old man, the chief was, was sitting there, and he was very thinking quite a bit. This he did not really want to give up his daughter, and so he, he sat there and he thought, well, I've got a situation. If we can do a couple things for me, we'll consider it. We'll consider that because um. You know, I, I think you're a really nice, nice young man. But he said, uh, if you can take care of some of these situations, we'll, we'll discuss this even further. And so, of course, the young boy said, yeah, I'll do whatever. So they went outside. And the chief was pointing at the, let me do another. Do you see this? And the young boy said, yes, I see that. It's like, it's a beautiful mountain. Yes, it is, the chief said. However, I have never seen the sunrise. It's always until after, well, after morning when it rises. And we are, and, and we don't really know what time of day it is because it's, it's almost afternoon by the time that we wake up. So it would be nice if that mountain was to be cleared. Knowing this, the chief knew this was an impossible task. So he said this young boy on his way, when you can get rid of that mountain, come back and we'll, I'll give you another task. So the little boy went out, out of the way and all this, and he started thinking, how am I going to do this task? man, how am I going to do this? So he thought, huh, the young, the, the dancing man, he took out the dancing man. So he opened up the box. Of course, 
the dancing man looked at him. He said, Talia Bonamuktis, how can I help you? And so the little boy said, I want this mountain gone. So the dancing man looked, I can do this. He's slotting in a sneena, I can do this. So he started dancing. And as he was dancing again, the young boy started getting sleepy. His eyes were heavy and he fell asleep. And when he fell asleep, he can hear people working. He can hear all the tools going. And as he fell asleep, he was still hearing the song. When he awoke, the mountain was gone. So the dancing man looked at him. He said, the this, I'll see you again. So he closed the door. And he, of course, the dancing man went back to sleep. So being so proud, of all of this task being done, the young boy went over to see the chief. Chief at that time was very satisfied, but he was just puzzled. How did you, I, I don't know how you did this, but I don't have time to really discuss this right now. We have people are, that, are, that are coming against us. You know, we have warriors that are close by. So I have to prepare the men, all the warriors, to face these warriors right now, this opposition. So we will discuss this matter about my, with my, about my daughter when I come back. Thank you for getting rid of the mountain. And so as he was... way the chief went to go what plans they were going to do in formations and so on and how they're going to defeat these warriors that were coming so it is when the young boy asked how can i help you you know how can i help you all the the chief told him you can help us by staying here with with our elders the women and their children and making sure that they're protected and in doing this, the young boy was very impatient. He did not want to wait. And so in doing so, he, the little boy, the young boy went off to the side. And when he did this, again, he brought out the box. When he opened the box, how can I help you? The dancing man says. So the little boy, the young boy is told the dancing man, there are a bunch of warriors coming and they're going to be killing our people, the, the people that are here. Um, I want you to go and to kill them. And so the dancing man, again, started dancing. And as he was dancing, of course, again, the young boy fell asleep. And when he fell asleep, his eyes got heavy and all this, and the songs were still playing. But this time, he can hear fighting going off in his dreams and people screaming in pain. And as, as he awoke, he seen many people walking away injured and so many others of the warriors laying there dead in their tracks. So, so then the little boy went over and he picked up one of the things that was from the from one of the uh, the warriors from the opposite op opposite side, and he took it with him. It was a tomahawk, and he took it with him back to back to the chief to prove that he had done this task without being asked, of course. And so the chief was very very happy but baffled. So he, the chief sat there and he was thinking, wow, this young boy is proving himself over and over again. So, so he sat there and they talked. And so the chief told him, you know, there is one other thing, one other task that I want you to do. 
And so the young boy listened. Yes. What is it? And so the chief told him, there is a magic, uh, there is a, uh, a big snake, a reptile that's huge, that's around here, you know, and he's been um, eating our people. You know, he's been going and uh, destroying here and there, these villages here and there, and eating some of the people around here. Wow. It's like, and none of the warriors have done anything? The boy, the young boy says. So the chief tells him, well, they don't really know. They've never seen this reptile. Nobody has. But we know that he has done this because he's left some of the uh, evidence behind. And so the young boy goes on his way and he tells the chief, I will do this. I will help you. So the young boy goes out. And after when he goes out, um, he, he goes, of course, off to the side, takes out the box, opens it. The dancing man looks at him, this, how can I help you? So with this, the, the young boy explains to him that I have to get, I have to kill this huge snake, this reptile that's around here, this dragon, this this huge monster that's around here that's killing uh, all, all of these people. It's like, uh, I need to, I have to, we have to kill. So expecting the, the dancing man to start singing and dancing, the, the boy looked at the box, no dancing, no singing. And he said, why are you not singing and dancing? Dancing man looked at him, because this, this is your task. I cannot do this. So the young boy took out his knife and he said, point me in the direction of where this snake is and I will kill him myself. So the dancing man pointed in the direction of where the chief lived. Isn't that we want? And so the dancing man closed the door. He put his box away and he went right over to where the, the wigwam was, the wigwam is, and he opened the door and he came in looking. He said, chief, the snake is around here somewhere. So I have to kill him. And so the chief um, being, you know, being very open, he said, you have figured me out. I am the snake. And so the chief took his robe and he took his power robe and he put it around him. And when he unveiled the robe, he had changed into this huge snake, this huge reptile. And so these two, they, they started fighting. And at the end of it, the young boy had cut off the chief's head or the, the snake's head. But when he came out holding on to the snake's head, he changed back into the chief. So from there, uh, the young boy became the chief of the people. Um, this is a story from um, one of the legends from the Mi'kmaq. Um, it's kind of gruesome, I know, but uh, this is one of the stories that they have told uh, a long time ago. So I hope that you have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you all again. And um, Oh. All right, we are back. Thank you so much, John Willie One. Beautiful stories. And, and uh, like he said, some of them, you know, sometimes when you hear them in the English language, especially, they might sound a little bit gruesome, but there's important lessons for us to learn. You know, we don't tell those stories just to scare each other at times. There's, there's lessons for us as human beings to learn from these stories. And, uh, you know, not only are they entertaining at times, but they also, uh, you know, uh, are part of how to live life and how to get along as human beings. Thank you so much, John, for your art and for your support and for being here with us today. So, 
So next up, ladies and gentlemen, we have artist Frances Sok Toma coming to you. She's from Madokmiguk. She's a member of the Passamaquoddy tribe, same community as I am. Uh, and she works in uh, Ashplant basketry as well as beadwork. And so she works with multiple forms. I've had the chance to work with Frances, uh, you know, at uh, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness when uh, we put on the Wabanaki Spring Social just a few weeks ago. She's, of course, a delight of a person. She's a tremendously talented talented artist. And she was also one of our featured artists for the Native American Festival. And so you'll be able to catch her work, hopefully, if we have that festival in person, we haven't made the call on that yet. Uh, but hopefully, uh, that may be our first in person live event here. So uh, good chance to see her when she does come up. Uh, we are going to be uh, having a pre recorded presentation. And we invite those of you that would like to ask questions. Once again, please submit them to the chat. We'll be having Francis join us at at the end of the presentation. And uh, I did make a mistake. I want to, uh, 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 when it came to the trivia, I did tell people to email educator at abbeymuseum.org. That is actually wrong information. If you did email your answer to that email address, know that we got it and you are all set. There's nothing more you need to do. But for the future, uh, follow the directions in the chat. We actually have a form on the Abbey Museum website that you can go and submit your answers. Okay. So we're still taking answers until the end of the hour for our first trivia question. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move on to our next featured artist, Francis Soktoma. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francis Soktoma. I'm a Passamaquoddy artist from Indian Township and a graduate student in Intermedia at the University of Maine. The last couple of years, I've been working heavily in the digital realm, producing videos, graphic art, and audio pieces. I've been driven largely by narrative, by the need to tell stories in whatever form they're meant to be told. This has been largely influenced by my experiences as a basket maker and the stories that my grandmother, Molly Neptune Parker, would tell about growing up at Indian Township with her family when we were gathered around her kitchen table weaving together. I started learning from her when I was seven years old in a couple of different settings, as a child, I participated heavily in community workshops hosted by the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, where me and my siblings could be found waiting for my grandmother's instructions on what to do next on our baskets. She was always very structured in her teachings, often planning out the colors and forms of our baskets ahead of time so we could focus on learning the techniques she wanted us to learn. When we made a mistake, no matter how far down the basket that mistake was, she would take it apart and have us start over. She was very proud of her work and made it very clear that if we were going to make baskets, we were going to make them right. I think this instilled a pride of our work in all of us that continues to this day. When I was in middle school, she applied to the apprenticeship program at the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance for me to be her formal apprentice. Whenever I was on vacation from school, she would set aside time for us to get together, to sit down, and focus on making baskets. This is when she would tell stories about growing up at Indian Township. Something about weaving or something about our conversations would trigger her memory, and she would talk about how it used to be. One of the stories she always liked to tell was how as a child she begged and begged her mother, Grammy Irene, to teach her how to make baskets. Her mother didn't start teaching her until she knew my grandmother was serious about learning, and when she did finally start, she did so using scraps of ash from Grammy Irene's baskets. The other story she would like to tell was about her father, Grumpy Louie. My Graham's family gathered a lot of their own food growing up. One of Grumpy's roles, in addition to harvesting ash, was hunting deer. She remembered him putting his food for the day in a burlap sack, and when he came home it was either filled with deer quarters or freshly pounded ash for Grammy Irene to make baskets. Grammy Irene often traded her baskets with local farmers for things like butter or cheese. Basket making with my grandmother quickly became a way for me to connect to my past from before I was born. Basket making allowed me to know my ancestors in ways that I hadn't before. During that time with my grandmother, when we were connecting with each other across lifetimes, I loved seeing that connection between me, her, her parents, and her grandparents. I loved seeing that unbroken sweet grass braid in my mind that started long ago, before we could see where it started, and continues to be woven within our family today. Now that my grandmother is an ancestor, basket making has become a way for me to hear her stories again. My grandmother was an inspiration for me in many ways. 
It was through basket making that I found the confidence to actually call myself an artist, which was difficult to embrace until I started making baskets more consistently in college. My family would often travel with her to markets. I would watch how she interacted with customers, always hoping that my small baskets that were on her table would be chosen. Every time they were picked up, my grandmother would proudly say, my granddaughter made that. After sitting with her at her table at markets for a number of years, probably longer than I should have, she encouraged me to start applying to my own space at markets. This not only helped me become more recognized as a basket maker in our community, but it also allowed me the space to branch out and develop my own style of baskets. It also opened up opportunities for me to experiment and challenge myself, now participating in exhibits where I didn't think I would ever have my work shown growing up. As the restrictions on COVID are loosening and I'm able to gather with my family of basket makers again to create, I'll be traveling to more markets and posting work for sale on my website. My website will be a good place to check in on where I'm going to be this year and to see what's for sale. If you scroll down to the footer of my website, you'll also find a form for you to sign up for my newsletter. This is a tool I'm planning to utilize more this year to provide updates on markets and product uploads to my website. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram where I'll be providing updates as well. Gene Willy One Pasita Wen, thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope you're enjoying Amen, and I can't wait for us to be together again soon. Okay, we are back, and we're going to have Frances joining us here, and we're loading her up just at the moment. And we have some questions, uh, Frances. Hello, how are you? Good. How are you? It's good to see you again, Chris. That's always good to see you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so that was such a beautiful video, by the way. I mean, that was really well done. And, uh, you know, seeing Molly in there, of course, you know, for all of us is, is such a special thing. Uh, you know, uh, just she's made such a difference to all of our lives, but also this institution here at the Abbey Museum uh, and how she's affected just everything, you know, with uh, in this area, you know. So it was such a pleasure to, you know, that you you included her as in, in listening to your story, especially. And uh, you know, you're, you're, you're like this triple threat, right? You know, you, you make traditional art, you do electronic art, you know, digital realm, uh, you're making websites, you're new, you're doing all of these things. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And really the, you know, one of the first questions, uh, that is kind of, you know, kind of like that, uh, the, this mixture of, uh, you know, our traditional world, uh, that we live in and where our arts originate from in the modern day world and how we fit all that together. And, um, you know, so, uh, the question is really about your education that you're pursuing. Um, and so the first question we have is, since you've started to pursue your Master's of Fine Arts, how do you say it has impacted your art? It's a really good question. Um, I think what it's done is it's um, caused me to think a lot about, you know, I said in my presentation that I'm, I'm focusing a lot on narrative, a lot on storytelling. And what it's been doing, um, I mean, my, I'm, I just finished the second year of the program, I've got one year, more year to go, is, you know, thinking about stories, not in terms of just like this static story, but actually as a living thing. Um, so as I'm, you know, I've been telling stories or focusing on narrative or just focusing on different experiences um, and conveying that, you know, that a story, um, you know, it's taken different forms. It's taken the form of animation, it's taken the form of video, it's taken the form of just baskets like that puffer fish. Um, and it's really allowed me to, um, I think, diversify the skill set that I didn't previously have um, to tell stories that really matter to me. Yeah, so you mentioned the puffer fish. Let's talk about that for just a second. <laughs> um, so that was a commission piece uh, from uh, uh, our uh, previous uh, rotating exhibit, Wolanka Yudeman, Take Care of Everything. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the inspiration for that piece. It's very unique, uh, and I'm sure it has some difficulty in the construction. I wonder if you can give us some of the, the, the inspiration behind that piece and uh, maybe some of the, the story of how it got made. Yeah, so um, so I was you know, talking with the Abbey team, um, I believe it was Jody DeBrine back when she was uh, the director of, of collections. And we were talking about this really cool new exhibit um, that they were doing with the maritime indigenous artists um, who are based out of Canada. And when they came up with the theme for Wolanka Yodeman um, and you know, really focusing on environmental harm, which is something I had focused on with video work before during undergrad, um, 
it was something that was really inspiring, but I, I still at that time just identified as a basket maker. And so it kind of was like, oh, well, you know, this is going to be really interesting. You know, a lot of uh, our Wabanaki community members over here, a lot of us are basket makers, or at least that's the community that I know. So I guess you won't be getting any baskets for this exhibit. And we laughed. And then I remember this awesome fish basket that was made by a Micmac artist. I think his name is Max Romero, but I could be, but you can correct me on that, um, where he made this giant I don't know if it was a sturgeon or a salmon fish basket. And it was the coolest thing, but it wasn't the way that I guess I would have gone about making a fish basket. And so it was like this, the second challenge was like, well, can I make it so that it's one just kind of uniform piece where there aren't a whole lot of pieces that you kind of have to stick together. So it became kind of this really cool way to innovate, but also this challenge where I was like, all right, let's push the boundaries of basket making. What other stories can we tell besides, you know, the rusticator story? What is this going to, what could this look like moving forward? And that's really how he, he kind of came about. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, uh, the, her uh, puffer fish was uh, also in her video. So if you go back and look, you'll see a shot of it. It's a really fabulous piece. And we've added it to our collection here at the Abbey Museum. So awesome uh, that, that it's been included here. Uh, we have another question loaded up for you. Um, mm -hmm. And this is really on your personal preferences here. You know, we have many uh, basket makers in the territory. And, um, you know, which basket styles are your personal favorites? And do you have a type of basket that you feel best resent, represents you as an artist? So I think one that best represents me is art. It's not any particular basket. All the baskets that I've made have been different. None of them have been repeated or replicated. Um, but one that's always been like really close to my family or anything with like flower top baskets. That was just kind of something that my, I think my gram said it was her, her mother or her grandmother um, started adding onto her baskets and it just kind of took off within our family. Um, so I think anytime I see a basket with flowers on it, I, I, I immediately think, oh, that's one of ours. And therefore I think, oh, that's one of mine because it's also my family. Um, and then what was the other part of your question? Uh, which basket styles are your favorites? Ooh, I really like, I've been really looking back at some of, um, the really like older generations of baskets, um, where they're not using a lot of really fine, um, not a lot like really fine weavers, fine materials where it's, um, they're take, use, like utilizing their space a little bit differently by using wider weavers or wider decorations. Um, I really am drawn towards that more, I think probably my grand's generation when they first started making baskets, um, but still find myself doing something that's not that, even though that's my favorite style. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's such an important message of, of our uh, Abbey Museum Indian market is uh, we're a very contemporary styled market, you know, we're, uh, you know, it's not, you know, you're not going to come to the market and see uh, just flute players, you're going to see a, a little bit of everything, uh, performing arts, fashion shows, a you know, and our arts do, uh, you know, develop and uh, are dynamic and, and do change and evolve over time. And it's really a reflection of the world that we live in now. And you're such a great example of that, you know, because it's it started with uh, basket making, but it's just spread out uh, to so many different mediums. And, um, you know, is the sky the limit for you? Where do you see yourself in a couple of years? I don't know. I think I had have a, a little bit of a problem where I kind of want to do everything. Um, I've got a bunch of ideas kind of going through my head, um, but a lot of them are taking basket making to a little bit more of like a sculptural form in the sense of, you know, how that puffer fish kind of came about. Um, while I'm in grad school, I have the opportunity to use a lot, utilize some different technologies, um, like a 3D printer that I think is going to make making that puffer fish a little bit easier in terms of weaving. Um, so I think, you know, whatever tools I have at my disposal is going to keep changing what changing up what I do. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time here, Francis. Your, uh, like I said, your your artwork is beautiful. You are uh, multi talented. Uh, once again, just like a triple threat artist, there's, there's just so much good work coming out of what you're doing, uh, and just all the encouragement in the world to please keep being yourself. Please contributing to our arts. We uh, just love every bit of it. And we're going to be moving on to our next artist soon. But I wanted to give you the last chance to sign yourself off. 
great. Just wanted to uh, thank everybody at the Abbey um, for putting this on. I know it's a different event than we're usually put on, but that doesn't necessarily make it an easier event. Um, I just appreciate all the work that you guys are doing and everybody who's tuning in um, and look forward to seeing you all either at NAF or at AMIM next year. All right. We look forward to seeing you as well, Francis, Willie One. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on with our program. Thank you so much to John and Francis for opening our hour up. Next up, we are going to be moving on to the artist team known as the Conti and Brown from the Penobscot Nation. Uh, they are known primarily for their jewelry as well as fashion, but they also do a little bit of visual arts. And uh, we saw that uh, last night with the kickoff party here. So um, many thanks to Dakani and Brown for being one of our featured artists again here this year. They have a pre-recorded presentation for you all. And then we will be moving into the next hour and uh, we'll be announcing our next question here very, very soon. So uh, once again, Dakani and Brown, Jason Brown, Donna Dakani, they are a uh, uh, very well-known artists. They have really uh, sprouted in uh, their expression. Uh, so much creative energy that comes out of these two. And we're looking forward to their presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, Dakani and Brown. In this picturesque neighborhood, not far from the Penobscot River, we visited a home of limitless creativity. Hi, Julie. Hey, Jason. How are you? Good, how Welcome are you? to our house. Thank you. Thank you. Virtual, Virtual hug. Virtual hug, yeah. <laughs> the power couple known as DeConti and Brown graciously shared their special connection. Well, we, we grew up together. We're in the same grade. We were gymnasts together. We were always, you know, really good friends. and. There's a picture of, um, of us when we first met at her fifth birthday party, and I don't really remember that. I do remember um, when she came, when she moved to Maine, and um, we were in first grade at Indian Island School, and I remember that morning lining up, you know, um, the nun would come out, and she'd ring the bell, and we'd all line up, and I remember Donna that morning, I remember what she was wearing and how her hair was cut and everything, so yeah. So what was life like, both of you, together growing up on the island? You know, when, when we were young, we were, we were very fortunate to, um, to have a weekly class where they would, they would take us, you know, um, for part of the day. Um, we called it, they called it culture class. We called it culture class. And um, they would teach us a, a whole variety of things, you know, beadwork, basketry, singing, dancing, how to canoe, how to trap. So all kinds of different the skills. The pounding of the ash the, for basketry. Yes, I mean, we, we did that a lot. They, they taught us how to make rope out of out of cedar bark. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just all these really, really cool traditional skills and techniques. So is that where the whole spark began with your, um, you know, making jewelry and the basket weaving? I always tend to say, like, as native people, we seem to we seem to be. Um, naturally creative and I, I don't you know know why that is you know maybe through necessity to have to you know make everything that you use you know we didn't have stores where we could just go and pick up the things that we need like we do nowadays you know um, so if we needed a certain thing we had to make it you know and a lot of things are made on the spot as you need them and I think that cultivated that creativity and that um, the ability to use your hands to create all the different things that you need um, and just the, the beauty in, in, in our Wabanaki culture. When I started uh, creating the jewelry and we started working on it together and doing shows, we saw that people really connected with what we were doing. They loved the fact that it was different, um, that it was sort of outside of the box of what you might think um, Native American jewelry is supposed to be. And, and I love that. There's one thing that I don't like is to be put into a box or a silo or a category, you know, because of, of, of who I am. You know, I, I, I always happen to say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a creative who happens to be Native American. Our family and our, and our people, our community, um, what we've found is um, 
they're, they're very proud of, of what we do. What they really like about what we do is we take the beauty of our tradition and we reinterpret it into a modern sort of context. Be because of what we do, we feel like we're sort of unofficial representatives of our people, you know, so we always try to make sure that, that we, we put our best foot forward and we present, you know, beautiful quality work um, that will tell our story and, and show the beauty of, of where we're from. Come on in this way, Julie. This is our studio. This is where we make all the jewelry. Wow, this is huge. <laughs> awesome. I spend so much time in this room. This is the hub of, of all of the jewelry making and the, the jewelry creation right here. For years, Jason worked outside of Maine at International High End Jewelers. He acquired all the skills to return home and let his artistic mind flourish. Like that. And then with that mark, I can take these flush cutters and um, snip my wire right there. Then I can take that and bring it over here onto my hot plate, and then I fire up the torch. I can bring that heat right there. Now this is Argentium silver, which is pure silver in germanium. It's finer than sterling silver, hypoallergenic, highly tarnish resistant, and it's stronger. It has a beautiful color like platinum. After the design work and crafting is finished, Jason and Donna spend more countless hours traveling to international exhibitions where people appreciate their unique pieces of art. You could say it's supreme jewelry fit for a supreme justice. We met Justice Ginsburg at Santa Fe Indian Market. She approached um, our booth and was looking at our work and um, and of course it was very hectic, you know, and lots of, you know, there was 10 people and everybody's like, I want, you know, how much? And So somebody kind of leaned in and got my attention and said, Justice Ginsburg would like to purchase this. And that just snapped me right out of like, I, you know, my unfocusedness. And that piece was, uh, again, it was, a, it was a free form Maine quartz druzy from the mountains of Western Maine. And um, I had done all the little sprig work around it and, and it really resonated with her, so. For people at home who don't understand haute couture, that's a big deal. It, it was all very natural because, you know, working in the jewelry industry and, and designing and creating jewelry for so many years, I mean, it, it was just one of those things where we realized women and, and men, people um, wear jewelry and they need fashion to go with that jewelry. So it just went hand in hand. So it was very natural and, and um, you know, participating in more larger uh, jewelry shows, um, being exposed to some uh, fashion shows really sparked our interest. We really started with creating our own regalia, you know, our own traditional dance clothing. And that's kind of uh, how we learned, you know, a little bit about sewing and, you know, things like that. It became clear that Donna's patience lends to her craftsmanship. It's in every bead she sews, every dance where she celebrates and pays tribute to her culture. So this is what you wear to a tribal dance? Yes. As you see here, we have the beaded moccasins. This is the first pair and only pair so far that I have fully beaded. Typically, our uh, moccasins are made of deer and moose hide, but I purchased a really lightweight canvas shoe and beaded onto the shoes. This took me approximately three weeks to bead. And what about this? This is part of your dress? It is, yes. So uh, our women, when, when we dance, we wear uh, what are called leggings, and we wear a legging under our skirts and dresses, and we adorn them. So again, I have the beadwork, um, the, the symbolic uh, trillium leaf that is, uh, trillium flower that is found within Maine. And then we have the Wabanaki uh, double curve design. And then this here is the first beaded belt I ever made. This has approximately 30,000 plus beads on it, beaded on a loom. Um, and Jason embroidered uh, my initials and uh, sewed it to the satin. And then of course he did the uh, metal work um, to attach my belt.
I'm Penobscot and I come from Indian Island, which is an old town in the Penobscot River. And um, it's our traditional village. Um, Penobscot people have always inhabited this island. We've always had a village there for between 10 and 12,000 years, making us one of the few tribes in the United States that was never forcibly relocated to a reservation. We still live on land and in a village that we've always lived in. The Abbey Museum is an, a museum that is focused on the history, cultures, and arts of the Wabanaki peoples, the people of the Don, uh, which are a collection of tribes up here in the northeast, uh, the, the area that we call the land of the Don. One of the things that's different is uh, with the Abbey experience, you're going to see uh, not just um, historical pieces, but you're going to be able to see the new pieces, the, uh, the, the new art that gets created, uh, you know, that is still based off of our ancestral knowledge but uh, is uh, showcased in new languages. The work that Jason and Donna do is a prime example of the dynamic nature of, of any native culture, and especially Wabanaki peoples. Um, too uh, often in American popular culture, uh, native peoples are uh, portrayed uh, only in the past. The, the sense of, of, of uh, the average American, of the authentic uh, native person, uh, is only the people that were here pre-contact. Um, and that's just a, 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 a sad um, misinterpretation of uh, you know any culture which is uh, dynamic in, in any uh, you know aspect. And our uh, Wabanaki ancestors, even with the arrival of colonization, um, knew that you know uh, improved technology was something that they could take advantage of to improve their lives, uh, metal tools and things like that. And so uh, we have a history, uh, you know, of going back even to pre-colonial days of, of trading technologies with other tribes uh, and improving our arts and cultures uh, and uh, expressions. And so this is really part of our culture is to change and to update. What a gorgeous outfit. Who do we have here today? This is Anna, and Anna is Penobscot. She's wearing a red pantsuit outfit that we created um, with the train. The color red is significant of um, our ancestors who are called the red paint people, and they used to paint their bodies with the red ochre mineral found here in Maine. The sides of the pants are adorned with glass cut beads and Swarovski crystals fashioned after uh, traditional Wabanaki beadwork. Wow, this piece makes me really happy. It reminds me of one of my favorite things, the night sky. This dress is covered in Swarovski crystals, which represent the star sparkling in the sky. The um, star that you see on the front is actually the Arcturus star, um, a very bright star in the northern sky. And it's overlaid with traditional Wabanaki beadwork patterns. The jacket as well is also beaded in white glass cut beads. We love the graphic uh, pattern of the black and white and it's accented with long uh, black and white uh, coordinating fringe and the dress is accented with shawl fringe as well and Swarovski crystals and blue glass cut beads for an added sparkle. This is dramatic. There's got to be a story behind this piece. There's an incredible story behind this piece. This piece is hand painted. It's called Armored Beauty. The jewelry that you see on her neck, her collar, it's raw tourmaline, raw citrine, and a bunch of different metals work together and adorned with um, these really beautiful and graphic pheasant feathers. Um, there's spikes on here, there's beads. Um, again, all the painting that you see on here is done by hand. A very powerful and very uh, meaningful story that I would love for Donna to explain. Yes, this gown is a true representation of women's inner beauty, strength, confidence, and empowerment. This gown was designed to send the clear message of consent, which is why we strategically placed the spikes around various sections of the garment, including the shoulders, arms, wrists, and bodice to really give the message forward of the importance of respecting women and consent.
So your jewelry led to the fashion, the fashion shows led to We Need Music, and that is how Firefly is born. And congratulations, because you launched Arts Across America for the Kennedy Center last fall. You know, I really wanted things to be original, you know, I didn't, it just felt right to me to, if we were going to create these, you know, outfits that we're going to send down the runway, that we should really create the music to go with it too, because it all tells a story both visually and you know, and with your ears, you know, what you hear and these traditional songs, they're not my songs. I'm just, I just have the honor of carrying them forward. So I feel like it's for me to be able to share them with my community, you know, that that's very important. And so, you know, um, this, I believe in April or May, I went live for the first time with a hand drum and sang, and then November 30th, I'm performing nationally for the Kennedy Center. I just absolutely mind-boggling. All right, we are back, ladies and gentlemen. What a beautiful video. Thank you to uh, uh, to Greenlight Maine for sharing that video with us. Uh, they did uh, some of the on-site film uh, here at the Abbey Museum uh, and, uh, you know, lots of information there. And we're going to be coming back uh, to an interview with Firefly, Jason Brown, uh, later in our program in hour four. But just to recap, we have just wound up hour two, ladies and gentlemen. In hour two, we had we began with John Dennis with a nice uh, storytelling performance, Mi'kmaq Stories. Beautiful job there. And our two featured artists from, uh, or two featured sets of artists, I should say, from the last hour were uh, Francis Soctoma and DeConte in Brown. And once again, we'll be coming back uh, to Firefly. We're going to recap uh, some of last night's kickoff event. Firefly was our one of our featured performers and really, uh, you know, kind of blew the roof off this place here, uh, you know, with uh, the creation that was made i highly encourage you to go back uh, and see that and if you didn't we're going to feature it here in our four of digital amen and we'll be having an interview with firefly and talking with him a little bit more in detail so we are moving now into the next hour and coming up in hour three back by popular demand with a musical performance we're going to be going live to jj or otero coming to us all the way from the southwest the abbey museum indian market features artists from the u.s canada all over the country here and we bring our native arts you know to here to bar harbor typically jj has been a member or uh you know with the abbey museum indian market since its inception and is one of the most popular performers that we have and Last year, his performance really set things off. He was probably the most commented performer that we had. We are also going to be featuring artists, uh, Kateri Aubin Dubois, as well as Don Spears. And just a few reminders, I would like to once again thank our sponsor, Lee Auto Malls, all of Digital AMM 2021, brought to you this year by Lee's, uh, Lee Auto Mall sponsorship. Much thanks for that ongoing support. Also a reminder, we are having a membership drive today. If you go to our website and purchase a membership today, $65 individual membership, then you will be entered into a drawing and we will be drawing one two hundred $150 winner uh, for a voucher that you can go to any artist in the uh, Abbey Museum Art Indian Market artist profiles, choose your artist and use that $250 towards the purchase of a new piece of work from you, the artist of your choice. So great day to uh, get yourself an Abbey Museum membership, lots of benefits that come with it, free admission to the museum, as well as invitations to uh, special members only events. So we are going into the next trivia question in uh, hour three here, trivia question number two, but I want to give the answer from the last one. Uh, so the, uh, the last question was, what is the name of the Maliseet chief who participated in the week-long negotiations of the Treaty of Watertown and brought 400 troops to the Battle of Machias? The answer 
Ambrose Bear. So those of you that did submit your answers uh, either to the email address, which I mistakenly gave you, or uh, rightly through the website um, uh, entry form, uh, we did get your answers. We will be choosing two winners out of the correct answers. One of them will be getting an Abbey Museum Indian Market t-shirt, and another will be getting an uh, enamel pin from our shop. Thank you so much for your participation and uh, wishing you the best luck on this next trivia question. Our trivia question number two for hour three here is, who is the artist from Micmac Nation in Presque Isle that created the world's largest potato basket in 2017? Once again, that question, and we'll put it in the chat for you, is who is the artist from Micmac Nation in Micmac Nation in Presque Isle that created the world's largest potato basket in 2017? And once again, you can go to the link that we're going to put in the chat, uh, and or it's which is on the Abbey Museum website. You can go and submit your answer in the form there, and we will be choosing two winners out of this next uh, group of uh, an uh, answers that. That we receive here for question number two. Okay, we are getting ready for our next performer here. We're going to be going live. JJ is not pre-recorded. He's going to be giving us a live performance. Uh, he is Navajo coming all the way from the Southwest here. He's a jeweler as well. You can definitely buy, uh, you know, his, uh, his artwork uh, and definitely check out his profile on the Abbey Museum website. But he is also an extremely talented musician. So we are given just a second here for JJ to get loaded up and I'm going to be turning the microphone over to him. There he is. All right. Hey, right. JJ, how are you doing? I'm good. How you doing, sir? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Good to see you back this year again, as always. Happy shiny faces. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I'm going to just turn it right over to you, but, okay. you know, do your thing. Give me a hand cue as when I need to stop and I'll stop. You're good to go. All right. I can't seem Get myself moving. I can't seem to get on with living. It's taken such a long, long time for me to be myself. A life of lies and disguises, trying to be someone else. Paralyzed by the countless times I've lied to myself. Mm -hmm. Did you think that I would ever forgive you? Did you think that I would ever forget you? Did you think that I would ever stop loving you the next time that i see you i keep on walking like i didn't need you the next time that i see you i keep on smiling like i didn't know you because i can never ever forgive you Can't sleep alone in this misery. I can't sleep when love has no mercy. I've taken such a beautiful ride through 
the sunless days. Never stopping to complain about this permanent haze. This life seems nice, but I know that this love betrays. Did you think that I would ever forgive you? Did you think that I would ever forget you? Did you think that I would ever stop loving you? The next time that I see you, I keep on walking like I didn't know you. The next time that I see you, I keep on smiling like I didn't know you. Cause I can never ever forgive you. I can never ever forget you. I can never ever stop loving you. I can never ever stop Sometimes you play the game knowing that you just might lose. Sometimes you leave the game and knowing that you just might win. Sometimes you're better off in the end, avoiding the sin. Mm -hmm. You say you want a good man. You say you want a strong man. Well, baby, I'm sorry. I'm tired, baby, I'm sorry. My love All I hear is silence, the lies and fragments of the truth. <clears throat> All I hear is whisperings, the rumors and secondhand news. All I know is better now to lose than to be with you. Ooh, you say you want a good man. You say you want a strong man. Oh, baby, I'm sorry. I'm tired, baby, I'm sorry. My love expired. I'm done being a fool. It holds you when you cry. I'm 
John playing superhero when your life is a mess. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm done. No more fire. I'm done. My love My Indian people, my beautiful people, full of heart, full of strength. Not long ago, we were forced to leave our homes. Our relatives died along the way. Cried and still cry, generations of pain. Yet to this day, we still remain. The U.S. soldiers that killed my family, children, elders, and everyone in between. Washington is not, not our government. We will survive. We will resist. Oh, yeah. We will resist. We will resist. Oh, yeah. We will resist. The elders cried, the children heard their own names. The youth is inspired, they're not afraid. They come fully armed with language and laws. The voices of strength blasting through bullhorns. We will resist. We will resist. Ah, oh, yeah, we will resist. The U.S. soldiers, they killed our families. Children, elders, and everyone in between. Washington is not, not our government. Oh, we will survive. We will resist. Oh, we will survive. We will resist. Oh, we will survive. If we will resist. Wabanaki Nation, we will resist. Navajo Nation, we will resist. The Hopi Nation, we will resist. We will resist.
Once was a time when I thought that I would never, never, ever leave you. A tortured heart in mine. I started crying at the train, the train that's helping me to leave you. I can't stop the train that you feel. Only time and love can mend and heal this aching in your soul. It's time for me to go. Cause I gave my heart away to someone else. Now I can't stay here anymore. You'll have a place in my heart always. The guilty part of me. The tortured part of me. I can't stay here. Hope that you can find a lasting love that never, never, ever leaves you. A loving heart divine. It won't make you cry at night, cry at night, because he's leaving you. I can't stop the pain that you feel. Only time and love can mend and heal this aching in your soul. It's time for me to go. Because I gave my heart away to someone else. Now I Tortured part of me, I can't stay. The guilty part of me, the tortured part of me, I can't stay. We have time for one more. Thank you very much, Abbey Museum, <clears throat> for helping me come out. I really appreciate uh, that first uh, time when I was at the, down in um, in Phoenix at the Herd Museum show, and, and uh, I was approached by <clears throat> by the folks uh, from the museum and uh, asking if I'd be interested in coming out, and I said absolutely. Uh, that's my first year in major markets, Indian markets. And uh, I really am just impressed by the, by the museum staff. And uh, I, I, I love everybody there at the museum. And I really appreciate the, the time they put into different initiatives uh, from decolonizations, decolon de decolonizing museums to all the way to um, allowing some res boy from Torreon, New Mexico to uh, perform 
a couple of angry Indian tunes. <laughs> I changed it up this time, uh, mostly because, um, well, I, I don't know. I just felt like doing a different set of songs. These are songs that are not recorded necessarily or out in public. These are more personal songs from all over the years. So there's definitely a little bit of uh, hetero patriarchy in some of the songs, like saying baby and those kinds of things. Um, but they're a snapshot in time and, and uh, that snapshot is just a reminder of, uh, of where, what I used to be and where I can potentially grow to be. So in any case, um, that's a little bit about me. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, um, I'm a, uh, a jeweler as well, and I make cradle boards, uh, Navajo style cradle boards. I've got a toothache, so I, if I sound funny, I'm saying, sounding out some of my consonants, that's, that's why. <laughs> so anyway, and um, thank you, Abby, for uh, having me uh, uh, wipe off the f four or five inches of dust off my guitar. <laughs> All right, one last two. <clears throat> I'm at peace. Got no more searching to do. But if you dare to engage me, I'll be right over here. You know, I am fearless. I have no more contempt for love. Since I know that love is me. And I know that I am loved. Mm -hmm. Sweet soul of mine, I think I'm ready to fly. Sweet soul of mine, let's give this world one more try. I'm at peace, got no more searching to do. Mm -hmm. But if you dare to engage me, I'll be right over here. I am fearless. I have no more contempt for love since I know that love is me. And I know that I am loved. Oh, 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 oh. Sweet soul of mine, I, I cried when I was sad. I laughed and I tried to dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. All right, JJ Otero. Good to see you as always, JJ. That was amazing. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. And, and, uh, for those that don't know, I have not met JJ in person. We become Facebook friends, you know, and, uh, we got to meet online during digital AMM 2020. And I was just blown away by the musical talent, not to mention the artistic talent of JJ encourage you to go visit his artist profile and support his art. And, uh, I love having you back here again. Uh, you know, just once again, it just, uh, for blessing us with our music. And I can't wait to have, uh, uh the chance to see you play live. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'll let you sign off, JJ, and then we're going to move to our next artist. All right. So we are moving along in our program here. We are in hour three. That was JJ Otero. And we are now moving on to Kateri Oban Dubois. Malaseed of Vigor. Uh, she is a beadwork artist, uh, also known as uh, Nizni Balsed. And we're going to be bringing her on for a live segment. She's going to be showing us a little bit about her art. And we'll also be doing Q&A. So ladies and gentlemen, if you see something of hers that you are more interested in and want to ask a question about, please submit into our chat, uh, as well uh, as uh, um, the Q&A function if you are watching through Zoom. And, uh, you know, we can definitely highlight some of those. Uh, also want to give a shout out to those of you that are watching from far away. Uh, we, you know, we're asking you to drop where you're watching from in the chat. And I've seen people as far away as Kansas and Florida. Good to have you all here with us for Digital AMM 2021. So with that, we are going to be moving along to Kateri. She's coming up right now. We're getting her on screen and she's going to be taking it away and introducing herself and her art. Kateri, good to see you. Hi, nice to see you too. Everybody can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. You're all good to go. I'm going to turn my camera off and turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Kateri and uh, my uh, Wallista Geek name is Nisnabalsit. Um, it is an indigenous name that was uh, given to me through uh, traditional ceremony. And uh, it is also my brand name because I like to incorporate a lot of my uh, uh, traditional motifs and floral designs into uh, my contemporary beadwork. Um, so I want to show you uh, what I like to do as my beadwork. So as you can see, I've set up in my home all of my bracelets. Um, this is the piece that I finished most recently. And as you can see, I've incorporated the double curves into this design. Um, I used a peyote stitch as uh, my technique. It's a more Southwestern United States uh, technique that has been very popular uh, and has traveled all over North America and I'm pretty sure into Europe and other countries. And so I have basically these ones that are all peyote stitch. Um, these ones have uh, a different technique, but uses uh, two whole beads as well as like fire polish beads um, and seed beads. I use a lot of crystals. Uh, Swarovski, unfortunately, is going out of uh, out of market for artisans, so I will not be using uh, Swarovski crystals anymore. Um, when I won't be able to get them. So these are basically uh, going to be some of the last ones I'm using. Um, also, I have other bracelets here. You can see I like using a lot of two hole check beads uh, to do some of my creations. Um, it, they're more contemporary beads and they're very popular. So a lot of designs are coming out as well. Um, I have a few rings. I've incorporated on this one, the traditional double curve. And this one is called the basket weave uh, design. I don't know if you can see it properly, there you go. So basically it's using um, peyote stitch, but also it's interweaving um, the beaded parts together oops, to make it look like a basket. Um, so there you go, so I have this. 
Then I move on to um, this piece here. So this is a piece that I created last year and I wasn't able to show it at the uh, AMM last year because I was in the process of making it. So as you can see, it is a beaded pouch and the floral design on the top is a traditional flower that we see everywhere. I've incorporated shells and um, also fire polish beads, crystals, uh, check beads, everything we find um, that is basically available in my workshop mostly and popular beads that are easy to find. The shells were actually part of um, a necklace that was given to my mother by her godmother. And uh, so I incorporated that in there as uh, a type of, I guess, medicine, just to make it more personal. There's some fresh water pearls in there. And um, this is a piece that I've done in the past, but I've updated it with new colors this time. Um, it is a collar necklace. It's just very nicely. It's very heavy though, because I'm trying not to make the form topple over because it's all glass. Basically it's thread and glass, even the clasp at the back, it's all glass. So it's actually kind of heavy, <laughs> but it's absolutely beautiful. And I have other necklaces here. This is my own design. Uh, they have Swarovski crystals, two whole beads that are not easy to find anywhere else. Um, so this one is actually a little bit special to me um, because I, I created it um, recently and I just love how it turned out. It's some of my favorite colors together. And um, other than that, we have a cute little Swarovski pendant here. So I will be making a few more of these um, and they're always, it's always updated on my Instagram or on my Facebook page. Um, and I usually update it as soon as the piece is ready. And this little necklace here is a St. Petersburg stitch with, if you can see this, but the beads here are not black. They're actually blue with kind of like a, a Picasso finish on top. And so it's very, very beautiful in the light, in the daylight. Unfortunately, we can't see it that well on the camera, but I guess uh, it'll have to do for now. Cameras usually change the colors of uh, what the eye can see. So I have a couple of earrings here. These ones are called blue. I just finished them this morning. <laughs> And I got a couple of studs here. Also, I'm gonna be making, adding more to the, my website and moving on to the earrings. I have some fringe earrings here. Some of them have freshwater pearls included in them. Um, a lot of Swarovski crystals, like these red ones have uh, golden Swarovski crystals that I'm pretty sure I cannot find anymore. Um, these ones have also, some crystals, it just adds a little bit of shine to them. And that's what I really like. Um, also these little earrings here. And everything is available on my website um, and the prices are there. And these ones are also a recent design of mine that uh, as you can see with the same ones, the, the blooms, I did the tops here exactly the same, but I added fringe and there are about a hundred I think there's like 138 Swarovski crystals in total in this pair. And as you can see, there's a hidden design in the fringe, which are two double curves. And so it's very subtle, but in the daylight, in the sunlight, it actually shines really brightly. And there you have it. So this is what I have in stock in my store at the moment. Actually, the, um, the, this piece here uh, is not in the store. Uh, the reason is it's actually not for sale anymore. Um, it was a custom piece, but I wanted to show it because I do custom pieces as well. Um, so that, and, oh, sorry. This is, <laughs> I wanted to check. <laughs> You got a glimpse of my kitchen. <laughs> I apologize for that. 
And uh, this is, so this is what I have. And uh, all, all of the pieces that you've seen are created by me, hand beaded, hand stitched in my workshop. Um, so yeah, uh, I've been beading for about six years now, um, consecutively. And all of this passion started uh, basically when I was a kid, when I started beading friendship bracelets, um, which I have not done in a while, but um, I think I'm gonna plan on adding them again because there are a part of me and a part that is very special and dear to my beading journey. So um, there you have it. Awesome. Thank you, Kateri. <laughs> Oh, and I got to apologize. This is the second year in a row that I messed this up, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I was actually so worried about it that I practiced today. And then when it came down to deliverance, I totally blew it again. So I apologize oh, no, for doing it. that again. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. I mean, we haven't <laughs> met in person yet either. Um, <laughs> and uh, honestly, my name has been butchered worse than that in my life. <laughs> So you actually did pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, for the for the Vigor part, though, it's actually Vigay because it's in French. It's Vigay, bit, that's uh, right. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. Malafite yep. of Vigay. Um, Vigay is, is basically near the uh, Kakuna region. Okay. Uh, well, it's uh, Saint, lower St. Lawrence region, like Rivière du Loup, Kakuna, uh, Temiskwata, uh, basically, it's it's not too far from uh, New Brunswick. Okay, it's just a little bit more north. I gotcha. So yeah, my nation has actually changed its name. Um, I think it was uh, last year or the year before. Uh, we're now called the Wolostogoyek uh, Wazibeguk. So it, it just means like towards the 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 river or where the river narrows or mm -hmm. yeah, because that's actually where the the Saint Lawrence River starts to narrow. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and thank you for all the information. Uh, you know, Wabanaki peoples, you know, the, the borders that, that exist now are not ours. Right. So we, you know, this whole entire territory is, is oh, all yeah. of our homelands. And, uh, you know, the, the trade network that existed over the entire territory was very large and included the uh, entire St. Lawrence region all the way east to Nova Scotia and mm -hmm. uh, as far south as uh, the Long Island Sound area. You know, so a uh, lot of traveling around the territory and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and your name, Nizni Balsa. Uh, would you mind explaining that for folks? Um, well, it, it actually means two moons. Um, the basically the reason why I, I have this name um, is because I uh, I entered womanhood um, in uh, it was a it was the year that there was a um, a special ceremony that happened in Eskasoni, Nova Scotia. Um, and my mother actually participated in it and it, um, it, it just happened that the same summer, uh, I ended up becoming a young woman. And so I had a naming ceremony, uh, with my mom and my aunt and, uh, that name came up and I, I had the, like the choice of two names and, uh, it was, uh, either, I think it was Odok, which means a uh, deer or uh, Nisna Bauset, and I, I, Nisna Bauset just sounded so much better. And um, it's it just something that I carried with me. And, you know, uh, one of my favorite animals is the turtle. And we all know that the turtle with the 13 scales represents also the lunar cycle. And so that's something that's also been part of my childhood for a very long time. And it just sounds like everything came up as I should have two moons as as a as the name and uh yeah and for some reason the flowers also come up a lot in my designs and that's why my logo that I designed which is right here has basically the two moons and the flower in the middle and I've been told that it looks a lot like um also, it's very um, representative of women, <laughs> <laughs> so, which is not something I, I, I had planned when I first designed my logo, but it, it seems everything kind of fits together. Yeah. 
and thank you for that explanation because people do see it on your on your Zoom handle and they might be wondering a little bit. And I wanted to because you do use that also on your artist uh, profile. And mm -hmm. uh, it's important for people to understand, you know, beyond the English language or the French language, even, uh, you know, the, uh, the languages that came here after to, to look at us, you know, through our own language and our own, uh, uh, you know, worldview. So thank you for mm -hmm. explaining that. We do have a question that came in uh, as we're starting to wrap up here. Um, the question from our audience is you describe your beadwork as uniting quote uniting modern and traditional styles unquote mm -hmm. how how does this dynamic influence as a uh, you as an artist um well i i try to keep my beadwork uh contemporary so it, it's um so that people who are not necessarily indigenous who don't feel comfortable in um, in wearing something that looks very much indigenous because of appropriation, uh, but that still want to encourage um, indigenous artists in their work. Uh, so basically all this influences me. I, I add in, so like, um, like you saw in the earrings, I add like the traditional motifs, like the bracelet, I add the double curves. So this is like a traditional part of who I am. And then I use this more popular technique, uh, like the peyote stitch, which, which technically its origins is very traditional to, you know, a part of the United States uh, for uh, indigenous people down there. Um, I still have to do a little bit of research on who exactly used it, um, but this technique traveled pretty much all over the world. It has become very popular type of stitch. Um, I also include like, you know, freshwater pearls or quills uh, at times or um, very organic materials to my beadwork so that, you know, I keep this part into something that will look original and contemporary that some people will be more comfortable um, wearing. And then I also have designs that uh, are very contemporary and it's just because I really like the design and I wanted to beat it. <laughs> so <laughs> I have that part also that influences me. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it really goes to, you know, what uh, the theme of uh, a lot of the artists today is that, um, you know, the art work that gets created today, um, you know, is, is it has a basis in our, our traditions and our culture, um, but is a reflection of the world that we live in now. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's a, I like to, you know, reorient sometimes people's expectations that uh, what you do is, uh, you know, uh, extremely um, uh, authentic, you know, to you as a Maliseet woman uh, in the and uh, not just to our traditions, but even in the contemporary context of how how we live today. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's such a reflection. Uh, we got another question. We actually have a little bit of extra time. So we're going to keep you here for just a minute, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so the question is about color. Um, where do you get your inspiration for your color combinations? And uh, a very nice, they are lovely. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I guess having grown up in a house that was always very colorful, um, as you can see, this piece behind me it was created by my mom. She's an artist. She's a, she's a painter, a visual artist. And so our house always had like colors on the walls. And um, she always taught us how to draw and how to mix colors together. Uh, I, I say us because uh, my, I have a sibling. I have my brother. Um, but yeah, she, she was always... Uh, teaching us something new with art. Um, she also studied in visual art. So that influenced me. And I was very creative too, from a very young age. I, I, I liked, um, I always liked mixing colors together. I always liked um, very colorful, um, vibrant colors. Um, and I think it shows uh, in my, uh, in my beadwork. I, when I have to get out of my comfort zone, it's more like, you know, browns and dark colors, matte colors, um, gray. Those are not colors that I usually go for. And, but I know a lot of people like them. So I, I force myself to create with that, but um, I don't know, I guess, yeah, just having, you know, coloring books every Christmas and just, <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a thing in my house. We had coloring books uh, every Christmas with a bunch of crayons. And, you know, my mom taught us how to color within the lines and, you know, make sure to, you know, just be expressive and just, you know, go for it. And yeah, that's, I, I also had art classes and mm. it's it's not something that was, it's something that was taught, but it's always something that I had in, in me as well. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Kateri. I mean, your artwork is beautiful. For those of you that would like to purchase the pieces that she has, you can go and check out her artist profile at the Abbey Museum website, and that will link you to her website uh, where you can get in contact with her to purchase some of these items. And we highly encourage you to do so here. This is a market. Uh, we're looking to uh, support these artists here today. And the best way you can support them is by buying their work and enjoying it. So Kateri, we are going to be moving on to our next artist here i wanted Absolutely. to give you the last chance to sign yourself off and say goodbye perfect well well Ewan, for having me and uh i look forward to having an in-person market again at the uh, abbey museum because i love it and it's a tradition with me been there from the start and uh i, I really look forward to meeting you in person too <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely willie one cattery up judge right. bye after bye Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving along to our next featured artist coming up for the last part of our three. That is artist Dawn Spears. Dawn was with us last year. She is Narragansett and Choctaw. She hails from the state of Rhode Island, uh, works in multiple mediums, uh, clothing, diverse arts, painting, illustration, a little bit of everything. And she did give us a, a, a quite a, a great sampling of uh, the different um, um, uh, mediums that she does work in. I'm really, really interested to see what she's got for us this year. So we're bringing her on right now. And I see her screen. We just don't see her. There she is. And she is in her shop, it looks like. How are you doing, Dawn? <laughs> everything looks so beautifully set up. Hi. Hi. Um Yes. Good to see you, Chris. Absolutely. So I'm going to just turn my camera off and I'm going to turn it over to you for your segment. And I'll be coming back for some Q&A with you in a little bit. Hi, everyone. My name is Dawn Spears. I am Narragansett and I'm Zooming today from Rhode Island. Um, I, I guess this is my opportunity to share a little bit of the work that I do. Um, as Chris said, I was on last year sharing a lot of the, my work. Um, I am uh, categorized as a diverse arts artist, but it's really more um, contemporary. I work with bright colors and I work in contemporary, so contemporary mediums. Uh, so as you see behind me, I have uh, everything from paintings to paintings on handbags, on sneakers, on clothing, <clears throat> excuse me, but I have to always um, say that, you know, I'm in that space now, but what will always resonate in, in my work is my initial work, which was um, being a doll maker. I make cornhouse dolls. So you'll see here I have some cornhouse styles that are dyed. These are commercially dyed. I do also make dolls where I'm using natural dyes and I actually like harvesting my materials and, and making my um, own dyes, but sometimes the convenience, you know, leads you to the, to the, to the um, commercial dyes, unfortunately. But what I do with these commercial dyes is I actually really play with them and I play with my colors and I really get my hands dirty. Uh, so I have several of those dolls in different colors. And during the holidays, especially at Christmas time, I make angels. So I don't want to forget that. And then I've been making a lot of flowers and decorating these dolls with their own bouquets. That's been my 2020 thing, 2020, 2021 thing. Um, so to share, let me see, how do I do this? Uh, quickly 
share two very, very fancy dolls, I say, because I can make dolls that are, you know, just the corn husks, but I also make dolls that are dressed and so fully clothed. And I really like making them and then photo photographing them in different scenarios. And the one thing that I like to share is that, you know, these dolls, they become part of my life. <laughs> they become part of my family. You know, they, they are like my children. So I like having them go to good homes and in, and having kind of their stories go with them. I've ha I had one doll I worked on that traveled with me. Geez, I think it traveled with me across the country before I passed it on to its new owner. So that doll definitely carried an interesting story. So what I do more now today is I paint accessories. So sneakers, And I <clears throat> show you very close. These are all hand done. I actually do all of this freehand and I build my colors. So I'll start with a lighter color and then I work up until I get the vibrancy that I'm looking for. I have several pairs available right now, including this pair, which is a men's pair. This is actually almost done and I will have this for sale soon. It's a size, it's a men's 12 or a women's 14. And I don't know, I, these are kind of one of my one of my favorite pairs. I feel like um, the detail and the colors just came out really nice, very vibrant. And then this is a newer bag as well. So again, you'll notice that these designs that are on here, when I initially started making, making this style, I was really using the basket designs and designs that I saw in, um, in our, basically in our landscape. So this is a very good example. So if you look these, I did these paintings and I, I kind of took two art forms I was doing, which was really this just kind of graphic designs. And then I started incorporating them into my acrylic paintings. And, but I, it was taking those basket designs and taking those symbols and tracks and plants and incorporating them into my work. So, so you'll see here, like I've got, tracks here. I've got the water symbol, um, the floral design. Anyway, I took these designs and I just started really playing with that and it, it just turned into something else. And I let it just grow naturally. And this is, this is where I started. This is funny because this is a few years old. This is 2009. And, and then this is basically what helped me get to where I am today. And doing things like this. So this is also one of my more recent bags and really just playing with the more neutral tones. So it's grays and purples and some light brown, shades of brown and purples. Um, let's see, I have I have several bags and then I also make, for those that don't want to invest <laughs> as deeply, I have little zipper bags that I actually, again, the same thing. They're done freehand. I play with colors and these are very reasonable. I think they're $25 and they're, they're zipper. Some of them are lined. So you can use it as a purse if you want and you carry your cell phone, um, handy. And then the other thing, last but not least, I wanna share is that I have been doing a lot of clothing. So I custom, I'll do custom jeans and I'll do custom jean jackets. I encourage people to check out my website, um, which, should, which is on my profile on the Abbey Market page. 
I usually encourage people if they are interested in having me design something for them, for them to, you know, get the item, make sure it fits, make sure your shoes are comfortable, and then just reach out to me and we'll arrange, you know, the shipping. And I usually can get a pair done pretty quickly. I, I say give me a couple of weeks because I don't know what I already have on my schedule, but I like to, normally I like to do it and get it done pretty quick and get it back to you. Um, so that's, and I guess, if you see the big painting in the background, that's also a good example of uh, the style that, that it's kind of interesting because that was one of the original pieces that I was playing with those merging those two styles together. And then that's when I kind of took it to the sneakers because I was thinking to myself, this would be really cool like, as a scarf or <laughs> as clothing or wearable art. So sneakers were kind of the first thing that I did. And you have such a, a tremendous amount of creative energy. It seems like you can take anything and, and make it beautiful and make it your own. It, it's truly on display here. I mean, the Cornhusk dolls are, are next level, uh, you know, for a lot of folks, uh, you know, and Don's really well known uh, for those pieces as well. Uh, we do have some questions for you, Don. Um, I mean, so for those that uh, don't know, Don is not just an artist. She's a significant ad advocate for indigenous artists in the native art world as well. And, uh, uh, and we thank her for, for all of that. She's been doing it for a long time. What do you think our audiences should know about artists' needs at this time? Uh, um, well, I think um, that's an interesting question. But mm -hmm. I, think it, I think just supporting artists and encouraging them is really important. Um, and I think, you know, that even just using the word artist is always a difficult one because sometimes we don't like to be referred to as artists. We're just kind of creative people, you know, and, and, it, and it's culture bears, right? You do what you do because you need to do it for your family. So um, I think being understanding and supportive of artists at all levels, you know, whether they're emerging or, and, and, ask them questions ask them about their work ask them why you know they made a piece or and be willing to you know learn that about them I think that'd be really important yeah and I, th I think that's one of the values of our event here today is that people not only can you know see the artists work and buy from them but they get a first person perspective education from the artists themselves about their own stories and and how they incorporate you know their their cultural teachings within uh their artist mediums and and uh you know you work in just about any medium i've ever seen so it's it's amazing to see the creations that come out uh you know from you that's for sure um we have another question for you how are indigenous designers shaping trends in contemporary fashion? Um, that's a yeah. good question too. Yeah, um, what, are you, what are you seeing out there? I mean, I, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a indigenous fashion follower, you know? Um, <laughs> I feel like I, I try to stay on top of what the trends are myself, but yes, I would like to be one of those trendsetters and, <laughs> and not always be a follower. So, you know, um, I think um, I so there's like a fine line there because you know we want to support our artists we want to we do want to you know support them and buy their merchandise and stuff but we also have to be careful and make sure that we're buying merchandise from native people like I think there's a concern with um, the misappropriation of designs and I, I see it a lot and I I just. I encourage people to make sure that they're buying items from the artists that that design it belongs to, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of copycats out there and even situations where it wasn't sourced respectfully. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's a very real concern. I mean, too often uh, in the modern day times, an artist will put a picture on Instagram of a piece they have for sale, and then that literal design ends up on a dress in Paris, uh, you know, copied and plagiarized. And it does happen. It's not something that has gone away. Um, so we have one more question for you. Audience question here. 
Uh, let's see. She seems to have moved into use of much more vibrant color. Okay, so you have seen seem to have moved into much uh, uh, to use of much more vibrant colors in your recent work. What are the roots of that step? And that, that also, it seems to be reflective of a more celebratory or hopeful spirit. Is is that correct? Um, I guess I guess it could be. I think I've always kind of gravitated towards the vibrant colors that are just in our natural world. And, and then I guess it kind of evolved from there what, what I could create, you know, on my own. But I mean, I, I love a beautiful sunrise or a beautiful sunset, you know, and I would always be out trying to photograph it. I mean, that's something that nobody ever really sees is that I, I do tons of photography. So I always have photo cards. And and even in my photography, you'll see that those bright, vibrant colors, you know, I, um, so I prefer what is in nature, you know, but so what you'll see a lot of times in my, in my um, work is me still trying to bring that back, bring those colors that I saw to life again. And but I, I will say there's nothing like seeing it firsthand, you know? Right. Yeah. No. And that's totally true. I mean, our, our world is, is, is so bright and it changes throughout the year, the colors and everything like that. You know, it, it's uh, it's vibrant in, in many ways. And uh, it, it's totally, you know, um, uh, just within our worldview to to take those colors and use them in a, in a very bright way. And uh, sometimes folks, uh, you know, try, try to put native arts in a box and only certain colors can be used, yet the natural world is not that way. Um, you know, so, and I really appreciate, you know, what you're doing, uh, especially for uh, the art world. Uh, but I mean, you know, you, your family, uh, all of you are so involved uh, with maintaining uh, cultural continuity within your region. And uh, it's so much appreciated, Don. And thank you so much for being here today with us. Once again, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please support our artists. If you would love to purchase some of the items that Dawn has for sale, you can go to her artist profile. We have it in the chat and uh, that will lead you to contact information for Dawn and you can talk over how to get these items for yourself. And with that, we're going to be moving into our next hour. I want to give you the last chance to sign yourself off and say goodbye, Dawn. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me and thanks for having this event again this year. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> we are moving on. We are halfway through. We are at the halfway mark, ladies and gentlemen. So in hour three, oh, just a recap of the last hour, by the way, uh, we had a music performance by J.J. Otero. We had also two featured artists, Kateri Aubin Dubois and Dawn Spears were featured in the last hour. Going into the next hour, we're going to change things up a little bit. If you were fortunate enough to see our kickoff event last night, this is a good chance actually for a break for you. We are going to be going into a pre-recorded cut of uh, the kickoff events uh, very shortly here. But before we get into that, uh, I would like to get into our um, uh, trivia question and I'm looking for that to pop up. All right. So we are all set. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be going into in the upcoming hour. Uh, we're going to see a, a, a recut of uh, last night's performances that were on the kickoff event. So if you did see the events, a good time for you to take a good 25 minute break. We're going to come back with some Q&A with Firefly himself. So make sure you come back for the Q&A and we'll be featuring an artist later in the hour, Karen Ann Hoffman, and having some Q&A with her as well. On to the trivia. Last hour's question was, who is the artist from Micmac Nation in Presque Isle that created the world's largest potato basket in 2017? If you answered Richard Silliboy, you got it right. Congratulations. We'll be picking two winners out of the correct answers that were submitted through the Abbey Museum website. We have a new question coming up for our next hour. Get ready. Here we go. New question is, what are the names of the two Penobscot guides who assisted Henry David Thoreau in navigating the upper reaches of the Penobscot River? Once again, here's that question. What are the names of the two Penobscot guides who assisted Henry David Thoreau 
in navigating the upper reaches of the Penobscot River. And once again, you can submit your answers to the Abbey Museum website. We have a, a form that you can fill out and give your answers through there. We will be picking two winners this next hour. Uh, one of them will get an Abbey Museum Indian Market uh, t-shirt and another will get an enamel pin from our, uh, our shop. And uh, so once again, we have coming up, we have a re-airing of last night's performances from Firefly and Jennifer Pick too. We're going to have a live Q&A with Firefly himself and another artist feature with Karen Half, uh, Karen Ann Hoffman. We would also like to just once again thank our sponsor, Digital AMM 2021, brought to you this year by Lee Auto Malls. Thank you for your ongoing support. Also, a reminder that we have a membership drive going on today. If you go to our website and purchase yourself an individual membership at $65, we will enter Enter your name in a drawing. We are going to choose one winner, a $250 voucher that you can then use to choose an artist from our artist profiles and put that $250 toward the uh, uh, toward the uh, purchase of your choice from that artist. So uh, today is a great day if you're looking to become a member of the Abbey Museum. So we are moving along. Uh, once again, uh, the question was uh, uh, from last time was Richard Silliboy, uh, the Micmac artist, press guy that created the world's largest potato basket. The new question for this hour before we go into our video one more time, what are the names of the two Penobscot guys? We need two of them who assisted Henry David Thoreau in navigating the upper reaches of the Penobscot River. And you can uh, go ahead and uh, submit your answers through the Abbey Museum website. And here we go ladies and gentlemen we are moving on we are going to have a recap of jennifer pick to micmac nation who did some storytelling some ghost stories for us last night as well as firefly who kind of blew the roof off this place and uh so great chance if you saw the performances it, it's a good opportunity to take a break if you didn't you are gonna want to stick around and watch we are going to be coming up with q a with firefly directly following with that here we go ladies and gentlemen So we have had a request from somebody in the audience today, and that is for a very old Micmac story called the Micmac Snow Vampire. Of course, it's not snowing out, and we are down at the water, but this could happen anywhere in Maine, and that is what is truly terrifying. For in the days of the old ones, there was a Micmac encampment. This Micmac encampment had a young man and when the young man was a very little boy, it was quickly learned that he had a lot of magic within him, or what the Passamaquoddies would call Madaulin. Now, with this magic, he did not use it for good. He tended to use it for more dark purposes. Evil, one might say. And so the, the village started to believe in him as the dark magician. Of course, magician, was not really a word that we would use. So in Micmac, they may have called him something like a dark buonac. The young man had evil intent in his heart. And as he grew, he wanted to do what other young men wanted to do, though. He wanted to have a partner. He wanted to have a family of his own. So what he did is he picked out a beautiful young maiden in the village, and he told his mother that he wanted to marry her. So in the traditional way of things, he sent his mother over to her parents in order to ask their permission. As he waited, he paced, and he paced, and he paced, and he paced back and forth, and as he paced, he thought, I'm a catch. I am strong, I am young, I am full of magic. She would absolutely want to marry me. When his mother came back, he could not wait for the answer. He runs out and he says, Mother, what did her parents tell you? And she said, I'm sorry, my son, but they said no. They explained that you are so full of dark magic, they are afraid that you will turn it on them at some point. He was furious, absolutely furious, and he did not believe his mother. So he went to the young woman's family himself. And as he trods along, he approaches the wigwam and he lifts up the flap and he ducks in and he sees her since she is sitting on the bottom, on the floor. 
and she is weaving her, her ash splint baskets. And as she is diligently working, he goes over and he picks up a stick and he tosses it into her lap. If she accepts the stick, she accepts him. But if she rejects the stick and throws it away, she rejects his advance. What do you think she did? Don't be shy. She rejected. She rejected him by throwing the stick away. This infuriated the young man even more than he had been before. And he stormed out of the wigwam and back to his own. But on his way, he started thinking again. And he started to think how strong he was, how powerful he was. And he decided that this slight would not go unchallenged. So that night, he went into his special herb stash and he put together a wicked concoction in his hand. It started to snow and his footfalls were very, very slight. You could barely hear him move through the village that night. And as he approached her wigwam, he lifted up the flap and ducked in to find her asleep. Over to her sleeping body he crept and he put the herbs over her nose and mouth and then he said his magic words. They were full of horrible intent, but he wasn't done. He went outside and he collected snow in two large handfuls, and then he went back in and he put the big snowball underneath her neck, and then he left. The next morning, the young woman wakes up and she is stiff and she is sore and she feels cold to her very bones. She's ravenous, she's hungry. She goes running outside and she begins to gobble up snow by the handfuls. And her mother comes out and screaming at her, what is wrong, my daughter? She says, I don't know. And she keeps shoving snow into her mouth. Her mother eventually collects her, gets her back inside the wigwam. But every day, the young woman grows stronger and stronger. And she begins to become more feral, more monstrous in her appearance, very much like the things we know that exist in the far north. Her teeth begin to grow, her nails begin to get longer, and she begins to get a hunched back. And as the days go on, she becomes more and more misshapen. Until one day, there were children playing outside of her parents' wigwam, and she heard them. And her parents had taken the time to keep her from others in the village by tying her with moose hide. She broke apart the moose hide that day, and then she ran around trying to get the children like a hungry wolf. They were terrified, obviously, and went home screaming to their parents. The next day, the chief came with seven hunters to her father's wigwam, and her father knew what was going to happen. He begged and begged and begged the chief to not kill his daughter, but his daughter went to him, and misshapen as she was, she went up to him and said, Father, you know this is the way it has to be. Please don't let me live like this. I cannot continue. And so the chief gave his command, and the seven hunters all pulled an arrow and notched it and let it fly. Seven arrows thumped into her chest all at once, and she fell to the ground dead. But as she fell, a miraculous change overtook her, and she became a beautiful young woman by the time she hit the ground. But the arrows had disappeared. The chief, in order to finish this out, took his hunters and went on to the dark magician's wigwam because he wanted to end this once and for all. As they approach the wigwam, they hear this keening, and the keening is bouncing off the trees. It's everywhere. It is so loud, they think they will go deaf. But they recognize it also as the keening of his mother. For when they approach his wigwam, and they lift the flap, and they duck in, what they find is her over his dead body, with seven arrows sticking out of his chest. This leaves us with a question. Because the story is the Micmac Snow Vampire. So who is the real vampire here? Was it the young woman who was changed into a creature with a ravenous hunger for human flesh? Or was it the young man with the darkness in his heart that was so tied to the young woman that upon her death, 
he died as well. So here we are at the Abbey Museum Courtyard. We are wrapping up this evening and I, and I really thank all of you for coming tonight. You have been fabulous. But I wanted to leave you with a special story. And this is why I'm standing here near the stones in the courtyard because this little stone right here reminds me of another story, a very old Micmac story about a man who wanted to live forever. What a nice thought, right? Immortality. It's not just with us. This idea goes back many, many, many centuries. And we Mi'kmaq have a story that goes in the days of the old ones. In a Mi'kmaq village, there was a man. And the man was full of magic. And he had a special kind of magic because every autumn he would go around to people in his village and he would ask them, remember, when I die, and I'm going to die soon, bury me very deep. But in two weeks, come back and dig me up. Every year he did this, and every year the villagers did as he bade. And of course, when they dug him back up, this old man would climb out of the hole as a young, renewed, vigorous man. And over the year, he would age and age and continue to age until the following fall, the same thing would happen. He would go around to other people in the village and ask them to bury him, but two weeks later, come back and dig him back up. This was very important to dig him back up. Otherwise, he could not come back. He could not rejuvenate as a young man. Years and years go by. People in the village start to get a little uneasy about this because this guy, he gets old every year. He dies. They bury him and out of the ground he pops when they dig him back up. This is a very, very awful thing to strike the fear in the hearts of the village people. So the villagers start to think he might actually turn his power on us one day. Who knows what else he can do? This is only one thing that we see of him, but maybe he has hidden powers that we don't have. Maybe this is something that could cause us harm later on. So that year, when he became an old man, he asked them the same thing. I'm going to die soon, and when I die, I want you to dig me back up in two weeks. Everybody he talked to said, mm-hmm. Absolutely, we will do that. You can count on us. And what happened is they did not do this. They did not go back and dig him back up out of the ground. What they did is when they buried his body, they took rocks, much bigger than this one. They took rocks of all sizes and they took and they put them in the hole. They filled the hole with stones upon his corpse. And the larger the stones were, the heavier it pushed down on the man in the hole. And eventually they built a cairn of stones over the top of him to mark where he was buried. Then they packed up their village and they left never to return to that spot. To this day, that man has not been unburied. To this day, that man is still out in our woods, buried somewhere. And I know that it's very tempting to go along in the roots of Acadia and you see these stone cairns that are built up. Or maybe on the shore, people pile rocks and you come across these piles of rocks. Never, ever, ever move those rocks because you never know which pile of stones will release the man. And when he comes out, he's not going to be happy.
everybody. My name is Firefly, and I'm from the Penobscot Nation, born and raised in beautiful Wabanaki territory. It's an honor to join all of you tonight at the Digital Abbey Museum Indian Market. We're coming to you from the beautiful circle at the Abbey Museum in downtown Bar Harbor, Maine. Tonight, I'd like to dedicate my performance to my mentor, tribal elder, Wadey Akins. Wadey has transitioned to the spirit world, but we feel his presence with us tonight, especially knowing that he sat right in this spot and sang many of the songs that he taught me. So I perform tonight for you with love from my heart and share my good energy with all of you and I can feel your good energy in return. Thank you.
All right, we are back, ladies and gentlemen. How about that? Jen Pictou and Firefly, they were our kickoff event performers last night. And as I said, something special we really had going on there. We're going to be bringing Firefly on here for some live Q&A from you folks. So uh, if you have questions for uh, for Firefly, Jason Brown, uh, please submit them uh, in the Q&A box in the Zoom or in the Facebook comments if you're watching from Facebook. And we will get them to Firefly. Here he is coming on right now hey there he is how you doing bud good how are you good good i mean what what a tremendous accomplishment i mean you know just thinking about the the production quality and the level of effort that went into that um can you talk a little bit about uh you know uh, uh what folks were seeing you know I, I saw a cosmic adventure of uh people coming from the stars and arriving here uh you know talk about your vision a little bit yeah um well it's that's great to hear you say that that that's what you saw you were picking up on that energy um the the story you know it really begins with our ancestors and the stories that our ancestors told us that you know that we came from the stars and um and what what does that mean you know um what were they talking about and um so the journey begins with you you hear a voice and the voice is sort of a cosmic voice and it says you know um, our ancestors you know told us that we came from the stars and if we come from the stars then we must have family still amongst the stars and so from that point it transitions into um, the the song and the video that I created called Destination Turtle Island which we all know is um, what we fondly call um, the land that we live upon so it is a celebration of of tradition of traditional stories but but done in a modern way in in, in a way that I'm interpreting it um, to be yeah. And I mean, it is so um, th there's just so many levels of awesome there. And and for those that don't know, the behind the scenes work is that a couple of days of filming, many days of uh, editing. There was actually you, you built uh, a, um, a scale model of the Abbey uh, Museum. Uh, I mean, so much work went into this. But I mean, when you have a creative mind like we have here with Firefly that just cannot stop themselves, if you give uh, somebody like Firefly a license, they delete liver in a big way. And we thank you so much for submitting that piece for our, our kickoff. It was tremendous in, in multiple ways. And, and thinking about your art, um, you know, uh, we, we featured uh, you and, and Donna earlier as the Connie and Brown, and we talked about, you know, your jewelry, and we talked about the fashion and, and the other aspects of your work. But since the start of the pandemic, your art has really evolved quite a bit. I mean, Firefly actually debuted with Digital AMM 2020. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the changes that have happened as a result of the pandemic? What prompted these changes? Well, definitely. Um, you know, we were full force, um, DeConte and Brown, um, and channeling our creativity into all those efforts into jewelry, into fashion, into the fashion shows. Um, and um, people often wonder, where did this music come from, you know, and why is this important to you? And so the jewelry led to the fashion. The fashion led to the necessity, as um, you saw in the, the um, Elevating Voices Green Light Main story that you played earlier, it came from a necessity to have um, runway music to go with our shows. Um, and myself having um, mentored with uh, tribal elder Wadey Akins and learning the traditional songs and having sung with different groups from Indian Island growing up, um, you know, it was a great way to, to put sort of a traditional chant, a traditional voice, um, and then to, um, to create another area of creativity. Um, you know, as uh, anybody out there who's uh, hyper creative knows, you know, um, you always want to learn and explore and, and look into new ways of, of um, sharing your vision, sharing your creativity. So it really was an evolution um, that took one step into the other. So, you know, we um, we were full force to Conti and Brown um, doing what we did there and, 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 and making a name in, in that realm and um, just so honored and humbled for all of that. And um, then COVID hit. 
and it it literally as it did for everybody else it completely shut everything down you know all the shows were canceled all the opportunities were canceled and you know we were basically like in our home couldn't leave all this pent up creative energy where are we going to channel this how are we going to channel this um so the how it really started was um you know a lot of times you know as a traditional singer um, I will get asked or I will um, join in ceremony or different community gatherings and, and, and share those songs. Um, as I say many times, you know, these traditional songs, they do not belong to me. I'm just, you know, I have the honor of, of carrying them forward um, into the next generation. So I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's an important part of what I do to be able to share that with my community. Um, so. I couldn't go, we couldn't go anywhere to, you know, actually in person. So I did my first live um, in the spring, you know, not too long after COVID shut everything down and just went live, you know, with a hand drum and just sort of stood in front of the camera and, and absolutely, you know, my phone, no equipment. I might've had some purple Christmas lights plugged in, you know, um, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I sang and I shared it, you know, with people. And from there, it evolved into, you know, each time I, you know, people, it resonated with people, they enjoyed it, you know, and, um, and I felt like it, it was an honor to be able to provide that. And um, so each time, you know, we decided to uh, do another live in classic, <laughs> in my classic fashion, um, you know, I always say like, I'm in competition with myself, you know, like every time I do something, I try to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this again. How can I, what did I learn from the last time I did it? How can I apply that? How can I amp it up? How can I make it better? How can I, you know, just pour more creativity to into it? So as you watch the evolution, you know, even from that first, when I went first live and then my first official performance as Firefly was with Digital Abbey Museum Indian Market last year. And, um, you know, and then taking it from there, um, all the way to um, being selected by Portland Ovations and Indigo Arts Alliance to perform nationally um, and represent Maine with two other incredible artists for the Kennedy Center Arts Across America series. Um, and so I got to really push myself for that. And again, here, this opportunity to do Digital Abbey Museum Indian Market this year, um, another opportunity to push it even further. And the way that we did that was um, we, when I say we, I mean Donna and myself, we, we got to collaborate with Team Abbey Museum. We got to bring our entire setup, um, all of the technology that I've accumulated and, and scrimped and saved for and, and purchased one piece at a time to just sort of build on what we're doing here. Um, we brought it all to the Abbey, and in a 26-hour session, two-day session, we, you know, we had multiple sets, multiple changes, multiple songs, and um, we we just all really rose to the occasion and collaborated. And I think we really made the most out of um, the beautiful spaces at the Abbey, the acoustics, and um, and um, what we were able to to put together, and um, just what an amazing experience for real. Yeah. And in hearing your story, you know, it's 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 tremendously significant that so much was filmed in the Circle of Four Directions room here at the Abbey. Uh, Wadey Aikens, of course, you know, known so well for singing in that space, you know, for so long. Uh, and we mourn his loss terribly, you know, but honor his memory, you know, very highly. And I love the tribute that you put uh, to Wadey uh, in that performance there. Um, and I would also like to ask a question about your name, Firefly the Hybrid. Um, <laughs> Can you tell us a story behind that? Well, um, so Firefly, Firefly was a name um, given to me by um, by um, a mentor, and um, actually a few mentors. And um, you know, I wasn't quite sure of it at first, and then you know, um, through some situations that happened um that you know i i really they're they're so special i really just want to kind of keep that to myself um i got a validation that 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 was the name you know um for me to use and um the reason why i added the hybrid on there is um i am half penobscot raised born 
born in Bangor, right next to the river, raised on Indian Island, and raised, you know, in my culture, around the elders. Um, many people knew my great grandmother, uh, Madassan from Indian Island. Um, they knew my great uncle, um, Sammy Sapiel and Bobcat, and my grandfather, Wally Pearson, was the chief of our tribe. And um, I also have Swedish blood. And, um, you know, growing up, uh, being, you know, half Penobscot and half Swedish by blood, always having to navigate those two worlds, you know, uh, being called a half breed my whole life as if, you know, it was something that I did wrong, you know, like a derogatory, you know, native people called me a half breed, non native people called me a half breed. And it always had this tone to it that was just kind of like, um, well, you're, you're less than, you know, because you're this and that. And uh, finally, you know, um, a few years back, it just finally hit me. And I said, you know what, I'm not a half breed, I'm a hybrid. And I really took that energy, um, which I'm all about taking any negative energy that comes at me. Um, I try to, instead of taking it in and holding it and carrying it, which is what I used to do, I try to flip it and put it back out in a positive way because it's a, it's just energy, you know, and um, we can manip we can all do that. We can all manipulate energy in that way. Um, it's it's really a, a mindset and a, and a and a choice that we make. So hybrid comes from that. It really does. Um, and, you know, they there could be some other, um, you know, connotations there, too, where, um, you know, like, again, our ancestors say that we come from the stars, you know, so um, you know, we, we have a physical body, we have a spiritual um, energy that lives within our body. So we are made up of, of multiple uh, layers and multiple dimensions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's um, tremendously powerful for an artist to be able to take, you know, uh, that energy and be able to turn it around, right? And, and that, that's what I love about your work. I mean, it, I, I had to watch the, uh, the performance again, and that wasn't even all of it. Uh, Firefly brought a uh, keyboard to the mix and, and a little bit of uh, dancing, you name it. Uh, it's all in there. So, you know, please go back and watch. Um, and we, we do have to move on. Uh, but I just want to say thank you so much for, for your contributions to, uh, you know, past year's market as well as your uh, your growth and your participation in this year's market it made it super special in so many different ways it, it's uh, your creative energy is is extremely infectious as well as your positive energy so i just want to say thank you for your existence and for your artwork and for bringing it to us here at the abbey museum and before we move to our next artist i want to give you the last chance to say goodbye and sign yourself off well, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to your team, and um, thank you to the ancestors and to all of our people and to everybody that's watching. You know, um, it's no fun to to create and do what we do if there aren't people to share it with. And um, you know, our our mission is to explore limitless creativity, and you know, we want to foster creativity in in all areas of visual and performance arts, and. Um, a personal mission of mine is, you know, people may not understand all this futurism and all this other dimension and all these worlds that I create, like you see behind me. This isn't, this isn't put in behind me with a computer. This is built behind me. So I'm actually sitting in this set. Um, it's, it's another way to create and it's another way to um, share the message that Native people, Indigenous people, we, we come from the past, we honor the past, we honor our tradi traditions, but we are um, of the now and we definitely are of the future mm -hmm. and um, thank you so much for your time and for this opportunity and everybody have a blessed night you too all right we look forward to seeing you in the future okay that was tremendous ladies and gentlemen we are moving along to our next feature artist karen ann hoffman from the oneida nation of wisconsin she uh does uh her work in raised beadwork a traditional oneida or hanajani beadwork style we're going to be bringing her on here very shortly and she's going to be doing a presentation on what she's got oh there she is she is such a light and such a positive energy i love having her back here this year karen there you are we see you giving her a second to get her camera straightened out and get herself unmuted. Um, all right. There, there we go. go. Hey, That's how right. you doing? All right. Pardon my back. Um, I'm really great. And I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really thankful. 
to you, Chris, to Jill, all the team at the Abbey, and to all the amazing artists who are sharing their time and their talent with us today. Thank you all so very much. So I'm going to turn it right over to you, okay. and then I'll come back for the Q&A, okay? Sounds good. Yo e ho, yo e ho, ho, kaiwan yo, kaiwan ye. Yo e ho, yo e ho, ho, kaiwan yo, kaiwan ye. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming to spend this next 10 minutes with me looking at Haudenosaunee Ray's beadwork. My name is Karen Ann Hoffman. I'm a woman of the Oneida Nation. I live in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, and I'm the beadwork student of Samuel Thomas and his mom, Lorna Hill, to whom I'm forever grateful. I was also raised in a home that valued art and lived and breathed art every moment of every day so that, you know, I wasn't even aware that art was a separate thing from life. But there came a time when I was, oh, maybe 25 years ago, and I took my first class in raised beadwork. And I began to understand from that point forward how raised beadwork really is a cultural hallmark for the Haudenosaunee people. We have been storytelling since we arrived on this planet, since we arrived here on Turtle Island, since our first contact with this environment. We've been storytelling. The old pieces of Haudenosaunee art that I've seen in museums and collections might have first been scratched into shell or stone. They might have been created with land-based materials like clay or shell. But now time has moved on and the materials at hand are very different for we modern artists. What I use are simple, simple materials. I use a scrap of velvet, the best quality that I can find. I think you should always use the best quality materials that can be found. I use a steel needle, I use a bit of cotton thread wax with real beeswax when I can find it. And I use just little small Czechoslovakian glass beads, typically in a size eight. It's always so amazing to me that with these really simple materials, we can stitch together a story that started way up in the sky with the advent of our humanity, hits the now and stretches to lay a table for those faces that we have not yet seen. These simple materials can be used to construct our history, our present and our future. And so I'm a slow and thoughtful beater. I am not a high production beater. For my artwork, I typically like to work with larger scale pieces, but I also like to work with pieces that are connected to the history of our people. And so for example, this is a piece here. This is Mound Man. In the state of Wisconsin, about a thousand years ago, Indigenous artists were busy creating sculptural pieces on the landscape. They're known as effigy mounds. So an effigy mound is a pile of dirt, like a bas-relief sculpture, a pile of dirt on the landscape. Effigy mounds come in a few categories. They're conical mounds, so that they're just shaped like cones. They're round mounds. There are even platform mounds. But the ones that interest me the most are called effigy mounds. And effigy mounds are piles of dirt sculpted to look like living beings. In southwestern Wisconsin, there is an effigy sculpture called the Mound Man. He was created perhaps a thousand years ago. When he was first created, 
He stretched 220 feet from the tip of his head to the bottom of his feet. 220 feet worth of dirt was moved from at least a quarter, but more likely a half a mile away, basket by basket, until he achieved this shape on the landscape, 220 feet long, three or four feet high. An amazing mound, an amazing indication of cooperation over time and between human beings and between skill sets. When you think about moving that much dirt that far, you have to be impressed with the cooperation that it took to create this amazing sculpture. You guys, native art has been on this continent for a very long time. It's nothing new. It's a continuum that we artists are in the middle of today and is stretching into the future. So when I think about all the artists that cooperated to make the man mound, I am stunned. But it's not just the sculptures. It's the people who wove the baskets that carried the dirt. It's the people who understood the soil so they knew what kind of dirt to bring and from where. It's the people who knew the trees so they knew where to get the black ash to make the baskets. It's the organizational skill because somebody had to feed all these people. Somebody had to hunt and gather for all these people. Some community really invested an amazing amount of effort into this piece of artwork. And I was stunned when I went to visit him. Stunned and heartbroken because in the 1800s, before the state of Wisconsin was even a state, a decision was made to put a road through the man mound and they cut him off at his knees. So when you go and visit man mound outside of Baraboo, Wisconsin, you don't see him from here down. That's all gone. That's a county road. When I went to visit him, that struck me, that hurt me. I thought about how that devastation of all of this artwork was just a cruel, cruel thing. But I began to understand that even though the art was destroyed, the humanity of it was not. And so Mound Man inspired me to create him in beadwork on this footstool. And yes, I gave him his feedback and yes, I put him on an iron footstool from the 1800s. And yes, the irony is fully intentional. I believe that good art, good, strong art, really can and maybe should cause people to think. I think that's what our ancestors did for us in their really high quality work. And I think it's a responsibility that we as contemporary artists have is to understand what message we're trying to continue. Move that message forward with as high of a level of expertise and authenticity as we can possibly muster. And then do our very best to let the materials tell the story. So when I teach my students, I tell them that their biggest job is to know what it is they want to say, know what their materials are capable of doing, and then help their materials do the very best work that's possible. Now, I'm not keeping much track of my time here, you guys, so that's going to be Chrissy's job. But I'm going to share with you um, a piece of art that I'm working on now and the story behind it. In the state of Wisconsin, I live in a place called Stevens Point. And Stevens Point was originally called Posse Keenan, or it juts out into the water like a point of land by the original inhabitants, the Menominees. Later in the 1800s, settlers came and George Stevens put his name in front of the traditional name for this, this community. And it's now known as Stevens Point. Well, Wisconsin in the 1800s was a terrible mix of um, indigenous people who had been there for millennia, indigenous people who had just moved in as recently as a thousand years ago, 
and uh, settlers who were coming in by the droves. And all of this mix of population, all of this mix of humanity displaced the original inhabitants from their homelands and interrupted a way of life that was thousands of years old. These things happened in Wisconsin. And what happened in particular in Stevens Point is that the native community was moved out of their homeland and they found themselves in a mixed group of natives, of displaced natives who were camping together just outside the new city of Stevens Point. Scarlet fever broke out in Stevens Point and somehow, somehow found its way into the refugee camp where the natives were living. There was terrible devastation in that camp. We're not sure exactly, but our records say that 30 people died or 50 people died, maybe 70, maybe 100. We're not sure how many natives died, but we know that there was death. And we know that those folks buried their dead on that encampment. And we know that in the 1860s, those natives couldn't stay there very long. Social forces just made that impossible. And so that mixed group of natives, they were forced to move on, but they left their dead behind, buried. Well, they were gone. Their dead remained. Stevens Point grew bigger and bigger, and they looked at that encampment in Stevens Point, and they turned it into two things at first, a quarry and a garbage dump. So our archaeological investigations now show native burials, our natives buried under historic garbage. By 1894, when nobody would buy that piece of land because newspaper records say, of course, no one would buy it, everyone knew it was a graveyard, that land got transferred through a series of land transfers and ultimately the Stevens Point Normal School opened its doors on that graveyard. That was 1894. Nowadays, that's called the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. It takes me back to my original idea that our art should make people think, that our art should be connected to both the past and the future. And so there is a piece of art that is going to grow out of that respect for that burial. I would like to see a native design and acknowledgement on that land, but for me, there will be a bag made for that burial. A bag made from this otter skin, trapped by a friend of mine, taken care of by a friend of mine. The decorations I told you, usually I work with Czechoslovakian glass, but in this case, because of what this is meant to acknowledge, the decorations will be made of bones. These bones are from a turkey that I myself killed on my land. And so there'll be that connection. On this beautiful bag, whenever he's done, and remember I said, use the best materials that you can possibly find. This is a fine, fine otter skin, and I'm very happy that he's willing to partner with me on this. I've created little dolls, little small natives wrapped in blankets, because that's what our archeological dig has found, little remnants of blankets on the university campus. Those would have been what wrapped those dead in those days. And so I'll make something that will honor, acknowledge, and celebrate the lives of those ancestors that came before us. Art is an amazing thing, you guys. Art has a power to heal, a power to include, and a power to let us look at things that are maybe a little different maybe somewhat joyful, and maybe span the whole breadth of human existence. But they allow us, art allows us to approach these difficult topics through a really safe portal of beauty, thought, and creativity. So I'm not sure if I've used up my 10 minutes, Chris, you can let me know, but I kind of think I have. Let me yeah. see. Yes, go ahead. Please. We are back. But yeah, go ahead and finish your thought. That's all right. The only thing I wanted to say was that I really appreciate the Abby for giving me this soapbox. I appreciate <laughs> that. But but more so, um, this has been a difficult year for artists in general, Chris. You know that. Mm -hmm. 
The studies that I see tell me that upwards of 80% of independent artists say that they have been impacted or severely impacted by the COVID. The studies that I see say that between 50 and 75% of independent artists considered bankruptcy during this past year because of lack of opportunity. And so I want everybody to know how important it is that places like the Abbey Indian Market really created out of nothing this amazing opportunity for Native artists to continue to feed our families and to take care of our communities. And I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, you're so well-spoken. I could sit and listen to you for hours uh, telling your <laughs> stories about your art. And, and, and we talked about this last year, you know, uh, and you mentioned it at the beginning that you, 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 uh, you know, in your world, you don't really see the difference between culture and art. It's, it's all enmeshed together. And when you create pieces, you're telling a story in the creation. And I think that really came out this year in your presentation. It was beautifully worded. I just want to say thank you for all of that. I learned so much uh, just from this presentation this year. So. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I'm going to say this. Uh, last year, I did this out of the back of a car on a, <laughs> <laughs> in a public parking lot because that's the only place I could get Wi-Fi. But, you know, as we've all moved around, we found better ways to adapt and to move forward. So I think that's a really important part about Native arts. We're alive. We're um, responding to current events and we're making it happen as a community. That's Absolutely. Important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your energy is infectious. I got to say, every time I see you, I'm always uplifted, uh, you know, and uh, I'm always uplifted by, you know, learning as well. I like just kind of sitting quietly and listening when somebody knows better. And, and you're one of those people that I highly respect just from our meetings here online. I can't wait till we get to meet each other in person. I look forward to it perhaps next year. Definitely, definitely. I think for sure we'll be doing that. So we are going to keep you on for just a second because yeah. we, we do have something for your, uh, our uh, next performance is actually we're going to have you tee that up for us. But I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping because we are entering our number five. Uh, and I just wanted to recap the last hour in our number four. We had once again a, um, a, a recut uh, version of uh, the Friday night kickoff with Jen Pictou and Firefly and an interview with Firefly. We just had Karen Ann Hoffman presenting her beautiful work. Um, oh, and we have a question for you. Yes, oh. let's get to that. Um, this is a, a number one, a humongous piece of love for you. Congratulations on being named a 2020 National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellow. That's, we should have mentioned that before. Congratulations. on That's really big news. Um, what do fellowships mean for artists like yourself? I think a fellowship, for me personally, it, it's a wonderful recognition of a lot of hard work. And I think it's a credit to my teachers. I think it's also a great responsibility. You know, that fellowship, that honor really isn't just for me. It's a chance for me to represent for all of the amazing contemporary artists that exist. And what that fellowship really does for me is gives me a variety of platforms that would not have been available to me before. And from those platforms, then I can toot the horn of Native art and advocate for all of us. That responsibility is deeply felt. Awesome. So we are going to, like I said, we're going to have you hold on for just a second. I'm going to announce the next hour of uh, artists and entertainment. And of course, you're part of the, the next piece that we're going to be showing here. Um, we have a theatrical work piece from the College of Menominee Nation, which Karen will be teeing up for us. We'll also be doing artist features coming up with Natalie Dana Lolar and Randy Smith will also be uh, doing announcement of our competition winners. Our People's Choice Award and our Artist Choice Award will be announced in the upcoming hour. Once again, a thank you to our sponsor for Digital AMM 2021, Lee Auto Malls. Thank you for your ongoing support. And a reminder that if you do go online and go to the Abbey Museum website and purchase a membership today, we will enter your name in a drawing 
for a $250 uh, voucher. We're going to give one away, one winner, uh, and you can use that towards any AMIM artist. And so if you like Karen's work, you can put that $250 towards her work, uh, and we highly encourage you to do so. Go ahead and visit her profile. The trivia question from the last hour, once again, here's the answer. So the quiz question was, what are the names of the two Penobscot guides who assisted Henry David Thoreau in navigating the upper reaches of the Penobscot River? The answer was Joseph Etienne and Joe Polis. So there we go with our last hour question. The last question we have uh, for our trivia contest uh, that we will be accepting for is in this hour right here. And this question is, name one of the several prominent Passamaquoddy people who worked with Walter Jesse Fuchs to produce the 1890 wax cylinder recordings. Once again, Name one of, because there was more than one, so you just need one of them, though. Name one of the several prominent Passamaquoddy people who worked with, actually, I believe it's Jesse Walter Fuchs, to produce the 1890 wax cylinder recordings. And once again, you can submit your answer on the Abbey Museum website. We have a form for you, uh, and we'll be choosing two winners. One will get a uh, AMIM t-shirt, and the other will get an enamel pin. And with that, we're going to turn it back over to Karen Ann Hoffman, who is going to introduce our next performance uh, from the College of the Menominee Nation, Menominee Indian Tribal Wisconsin, a digital adaptation of a traditional Menominee pageant titled The Raccoon and the Blind Men. What can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that the Menominee are wonderful storytellers, and I'm related to the Menominee through marriage. So there has been a long history of performing these pageants, which really are probably better known as plays. The Menominee built the very first public outdoor amphitheater in the state of Wisconsin, and they've been continuously performing plays or pageants in that beautiful woodland bowl since the 1930s. Now, with things being a bit different today, the Menominee players are still telling these stories, but now we're doing it in a digital format. So this is the East Coast premiere of the Menominee players, the raccoon and the blind man. Thank you so much for being with us again, Karen. Oh. And here we go. Ani Mani Liak, and welcome to the College of the Menominee Nation's video production of a classic Menominee pageant. While this is our first time producing a digital show, it is our sincere hope that the power of Menominee storytelling is conveyed through our efforts. Like all of our shows, this production is intended to affirm the teachings of the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, whose value statement reads, As Omatnomaneewak, we value our children, elders, and each other, preserving our language, tradition, history, and culture. It is our heartfelt belief that this humorous production honors those values. Dramatized from a traditional Menominee story by Joe Kashina and adapted for our production by James G. Frechette Sr. in 1966, we are proud to present The Raccoon and the Blind Men. Well, man, and for watching. Osomiko, we have come to hear one of your stories. I will tell you the story of the raccoon, the mischief maker. There was a large settlement on the shore of a lake and among its people were two very old blind men. It was decided to remove these men to the opposite side of the lake where they might live in safety as the settlement was exposed to the attack of enemies when they might easily be captured and killed. So the relatives of the old men got a canoe, some food, a kettle, and a bowl, and started across the lake, where they built for them a wigwam in a grove some distance from the lake and near a spring for water. A line was stretched from the door of the wigwam to a post by the spring, so that they would have no difficulty in helping themselves. The food and vessels were put in the wigwam. And after the relatives of the old men promised them that they would call often and keep them provided with everything that was needful,
they return to their own settlement. The two old blind men now began to take care of themselves. One day, one of them would do the cooking while the other went for water. And on the next day, they would change about in their work so that their labors were evenly divided. As they knew just how much food they required for each meal, the quantity prepared was evenly divided, but was eaten out of one bowl which they had. Here they lived in contentment for several years, but one day a raccoon which was following the water edge looking for crawfish came to the line which had been stretched from the spring to the wigwam. The raccoon thought it rather odd to find a cord where he had not before observed one and wondered to himself. What is this? I shall follow this cord to see where it leads. So he followed the path along which the cord was stretched until he came to the wigwam. Approaching very cautiously, he went up to the entrance where he saw the two old men asleep on the ground, their heads at the door and their feet directed towards the heat of the hot coals. The raccoon sniffed about and soon found there was something good to eat within the wigwam. But he decided not to enter at once for fear of waking the old men, so he retired a short distance to hide himself and to see what they would do. Presently, the old men awoke and one said to the other, My friend, I am getting hungry. Let us prepare some food. Very well. You go down to the spring and fetch some water while I get the fire started. The raccoon heard this conversation and wishing to deceive the old men, ran to the water, untied the cord from the post, and carried it to a clump of bushes where he hid it. When the old man came along with his kettle to get water, he stumbled around the bush until he found the end of the cord. When he began to dip his kettle down upon the ground for water, not finding any, he slowly returned and said to his companion, We shall surely die because the spring is dried up and brush is grown where we used to get water. What shall we do? That cannot be, for we have not been asleep long enough for a brush to grow upon the spring bed. Let me go out and try to get some water. So taking the kettle from his friend, he started off. So soon after the first old man had returned to the wigwam, the raccoon took the cord back and tied it where he had found it, then waited to see the result. The second old man now came along, approached the spring, and getting his kettle full of water, returned to the wigwam saying, my friend, you told me what was not true. There is water enough. For here, you see, I have our kettle full. The other could not understand this at all and wondered what has caused the deception. The raccoon approached the wigwam and entered to await the cooking of the food. When it was ready, the pieces of meat, for there were eight of them, were put into a bowl and the old men sat down on the ground facing each other with the bowl between. Each took a piece of meat and began to talk of various things and were enjoying themselves. The raccoon now quietly removed four pieces of meat from the bowl and began to eat them, enjoying the feast even more than the old blind men. Presently, one of them reached into the bowl to get another piece of meat and finding that only two pieces remained, said, My friend! You must be very hungry to eat so rapidly. I have had but one piece, and there are but two pieces left. I have not taken them, but suspect you have eaten them yourself. Thus they argued, and the raccoon, desiring to have more sport, tapped each of them on the face. You struck me. No, I didn't. You struck me. The raccoon then took the remaining pieces of meat, and made his exit laughing. <laughs> I played a nice trick on you. 
You should not find fault with each other so easily. <laughs> Poso. Stories like The Raccoon and the Blind Men were produced in the Woodland Bowl in Kashina nearly continuously from 1937 to early 1970s as the highlight of the Kashina Fair. At the request of Menominee elders, the College of Menominee Nation revived this traditional art form that combined acting, pantomime, live music, traditional dances, and theatrical lights and sound effects in 2016. We carry on the inclusionary spirit of the original pageant players because, much like generations ago, our shows are produced by a cross-section of people from within and beyond the Menominee Nation. Our individual contributions collectively add to the success we've enjoyed for the past five years. We gather every summer to form a community of theater practitioners who embody the power of Menominee storytelling. We hope you'll join us in staging new shows in the coming years. Together, we will carry on the traditional practices of Menominee Theater. Waiwanan. We hope you've enjoyed this production of The Raccoon and the Blind Men, which was produced by the College of the Menominee Nation. Our additional sponsors include the American Indian College Fund and the Wisconsin Arts Board. Additionally, we would like to extend our gratitude to Joey Wanhope of the Menominee Language and Culture Commission for his continuous patient advisement on our work. Finally, we offer our deepest thanks to Grace B. Korn for sharing her father, James G. Frechette Sr.'s files with the College of the Menominee Nation five years ago. Without her generosity to the Menominee community, our shows would not be possible. Well, when and be. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much to the Menominee players for that. And thank you to Karen Ann Hoffman for that tremendously powerful segment. Uh, love having her on here. It was such a great time. And uh, once again, can't wait until we can have the market in person and have some time together. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to announce our art competition winners. So we want to extend a special thank you to the sponsor of the competition for the People's Choice Award, as well as the Artist Choice Award, William Blair. Many thanks for sponsoring the competition again this year. The People's Choice Award, of course, was voted on by the general public. You had up until midnight of last night to be able to choose your favorite artist. The Artist Choice Award is chosen by the AMIM artists themselves. So this this award will go uh, is actually awarded from their peers within the Abbey Museum Indian Market. First up, People's Choice Award. Our winner is Jennifer Pictou, Mi'kmaq Nation. Jennifer is a member of the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq Nation of Presque Isle. She is a professional storyteller, artist, and historian, as well as owner of a nationally renowned tour company, Bar Harbor Ghost Tours. Jennifer describes her art style as a mix of traditional Mi'kmaq forms with an art deco flair. Her original bead designs involve intricate traditional double curves and floral patterns beaded into exquisite limited edition handbags and wall art. Currently, Jennifer is also studying and is a founding member of a group reviving traditional Mi'kmaq porcupine quill embroidery. Congratulations to you, Jennifer Pictou. Of course, she was such a big part of our opening night and has always been a big part of the Abbey family here. So proud of you for winning the People's Choice Award. Congratulations. Now on to the Artist Choice Award. Once again, this uh, winner chosen by the AMIM artist ourselves and our winner this year, Monica Jo Raphael. Her piece called Nimona Dawina Akin, Homelands of the Comanche People. Monica Jo Raphael is an enrolled member of the Cran Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, is a skilled artist who specializes in quill work and birch bark art. In keeping with family tradition and after dedicating years to her art, Ms. Raphael excels in creating complex designs while using traditional materials and techniques. By combining these artistic elements with bright colors, her work, works offer a contemporary twist 
to a timeless art form. Ms. Raphael is well versed in the traditional teaching stories and languages of the Anishinaabeg and is committed to sharing her cultural knowledge with others so that it can be passed on to future generations. Congratulations to our winners, Jennifer Pictou, Monica Jo Raphael, much, much deserved. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on with our program here, and we are coming up upon our next artist feature. And our next artist coming up is Natalie Dana Lolar, Passamaquoddy Penobscot. She works in diverse arts. She does a little bit of everything. Not only that, she's a scientist. She is uh, taking uh, the science of archaeology and she is indigenizing it and part of that growing trend of indigenous archaeologists. And we are going to have a short interview. We're going to have uh, and then uh, post a video with Natalie. So we're going to wait for her shortly to get herself loaded up. I see her coming on. Natalie does a lot of work with us here at the Abbey, and we've been so blessed to, uh, you know, cross paths in multiple different ways. And definitely such a pleasure to have her as part of the Abbey Museum Indian Market. Welcome, Natalie. Hi. <laughs> yep, we hear you. I just want to make sure everything was okay. Yep, no, you're good to go. So how are you? Doing good. All right. Um, so would you mind just uh, doing a little introduction of yourself? I, I did a little bit for you, but uh, I want to uh, let the, the viewers hear from you uh, about yourself and your arts. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Dana Lohler. I am a uh, graduate PhD student at the University of Maine in the Anthropology and Environmental Policy Program. Um, I am a multi-generational artist, um, all the way back to Toma Joseph um, and my Ukmi Joanne Dana. Um, I started doing drum making um, about whatever, 15 years ago now. And I honestly uh, started drum making because I couldn't find a drum. I wanted to find a drum for my, my son. Um, and I couldn't find a, a place to find a drum within the Wabanaki community. Um, so I, I, see an, I seen a need to be able to um, make smaller drums and here I am. <laughs> And I've, you know, I, I get to follow you on Facebook and I, I see your art continue to develop and, uh, you know, you're taking hides and, you know, scraping and, and doing all of the work that is necessary. So really from, uh, you know, from material, you know, all the way to art form, you're, you're completing all of the steps. It's truly amazing to watch. Um, so we got some questions for you here as we get going here. Natalie, you have many passions, uh, work, and responsibilities. What calls you to pursue your art on top of everything else? I draw my energies, passions, and love for traditional works um, from the, the blood of my ancestors who came before me, my, uh, my family. Traditional artists such as, like I said, my, um, my great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Toma Joseph, and my grandmother, Joan Dana. The hand drum um, is a way for people to connect to themselves and their culture. When you listen to your heartbeat, you can learn the drum beat of the people. A drum can be used to restore balance and regulate a person's heartbeat. The drum is powerful and is a medicine for your spirit and body. A long time ago, our drums were taken from us. My people would use pots, pans, rattles, small drums that they could hide to maintain um, the ability to be able to drum and make music. Only after the 1978 Native American Religious Freedom Act were we able to drum again. The Native American or the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978 that we have um, since then, we've been able to legally drum. This act protected the rights of Native Americans to exercise their traditional um, religions by ensuring access to sites, use and pos uh, possession of sacred objects and the freedom to worship through ceremonies and in traditional rites. My goal, um, one of my goals is to have um, a drum in every single Wabanaki household, whether that is from buying a drum for me, um, from me, from various markets, attending one of my workshops or buying from another Wabanaki artist that I've taught or any other artist, um, drum making artist. I just, I want, um, to be able to return our drums back to our people and their homes. Um, I think this will help heal our people. 
Yeah. And uh, as somebody that's a singer and, uh, you know, some from a family of uh, uh, people that study music, uh, my father, Wayne Newell, of uh, one of those people and, you know, tell stories uh, constantly. I've, I've grown up with uh, how the generation before us, you know, uh, how they kept music tradition alive. And uh, and you're you're right in that uh, sometimes they had to diversify the instruments to, to the point where sometimes it might just be a heel tapping on the floor. Uh, and in other parts of the country, other tribes had to do things uh, in the residential school system, they were not allowed to use drums there either. And so they began to create uh, traditional music using school bells and still tr continue that to this day. So this is not something that is ancient history. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed in 1978. I was born in 1974. So I was born into a country that did not allow religious freedom. And it's so important. I, I, you know, your healing journey that you're talking about is really uh, about, you know, opening up that, that candy box of our culture that has been held away from us for so so long and, and how do we reincorporate that so i really appreciate your efforts as as uh as as what you're doing with your art next question for you is do you have any memorable responses to your art that you could share with us um all the drums that i make through um, custom orders are, are memorable for me i feel that um people give me a small window into who they are um to be able to make a drum for them um I'm trying to think of one of the most memorable. Um, my, um, I made one for my Ukme and it had a, um, a small angel on the back made out of rawhide. And it was around the time when I, when I first started really customizing drum making techniques, like different, different techniques. Um, and I remember her um, tearing up because she, she really loved it. Um, another one that I can think of is uh, my son. Um, he was really young. I only had him at the time because I have three now, but um, he was very little. And I remember him, him jumping for joy and he was just so excited to be able to play it. And he actually played it all that day when I first gave it to him. And even now he has it sitting above his desk. So when he has breaks from school every now and then he'll sit there and drum. And it, that's the biggest compliment for me is for um, to someone to tell me that they're still using it and still making music. And uh, yeah, what a tremendous compliment. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the names you mentioned. Toma Joseph, I mentioned him earlier in uh, the broadcast as, uh, you know, as somebody as much revered amongst Pashmakwadi people. And of course, within Madak Miguk and amongst uh, both communities uh, in Zabayag as well, Joanne was much revered uh, and much loved elder as somebody that I grew up you know, living close by and I have fond memories of uh, you know being welcomed into her home as, as if she was another parent of mine um, you know so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Toma Joseph uh, and and pray and fill in some of that history for for folks of who he was and uh, you know what he did for us um, just right off the top of my head um, Toma Joseph was a person that created art in a way that can be seen as um, utilitarian, but he made a thing. He made things beautiful. Like he made um, trash cans. He made um, firewood carriers out of birch bark, uh, birch bark etching, and he put um, aspects of our language on there, which are um, he he did it in phonetic spelling. But um, a lot of our petroglyphs can be seen on his artwork. Um, he had a very unique style. Even now, when I when I see any of his um, people that post things and ask, um, or if I see things in mu museums, I automatically can point out his artwork just because it's so unique. Um, I think he just one of the things that I'm really concerned really um, concerned with is storytelling and the use of storytelling through anthropology, through archaeology, and through art. And he really um, was able to capture storytelling in his art and um, uh, capture a lot of our traditional stories within that. So thinking of, of how Toma Joseph was able to do that, are you able to incorporate that in the drums or, or the other art that you make, your, you know, your own storytelling that you're doing? And, and how do you do that? Um, I, I try to utilize it in every aspect of my life. Um, one of the things that I'm working on in my dissertation is using um, archaeology as a way, um, storytelling as a way to 
bridge that gap between archaeology and our communities and to be able to disseminate that knowledge back to the tribes in a way that is understandable. Um, I also use it in my art. Um, well, like I said, when I customize drums, I, it allows me in, to have a small window into someone's um, just a little aspect of who they are. And I try to use that as a way to make their drums and to show a small piece of who they are. And that utilizes that storytelling aspect of, of you know, a visual um, interpretations of who they are. And that's how I try to, I utilize it in every aspect of my life. <laughs> and it's so true too. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of circling around the fact that uh, Natalie is once again a, a scientist as well, and is doing work to really indigenize the science of archaeology. And there's something about you know the way archaeology has told our stories. You know, a 19th century science that was created by non-native people and it was highly used to tell you know the histories and stories of native people. Um, can you talk a little bit of how you're trying to recapture you know that storytelling in the world of archaeology. So we're, um, the way that I think about it is that archaeology for a long time has been missing people. And a quote from um, one of the ladies that I work with, um, Re Rebecca Cole, Will, um, is that thinking about artifacts dancing on the landscape, and there's no really no people attached to them. They're just artifacts dancing on the landscape. And so many of these archaeological reports so to me, I utilize storytelling in a way to bring, those, bring people back into the story, to bring our ancestors back into that story and to utilize um, Wabanaki language to reconnect um, Wabanaki language with artifacts and to, um, to be able to make it um, important or not make it important, but to I'm trying to think of the way to phrase that. Um, to bring it back to the tribes, to make sure that our uh, connection with our ancestors is um, is back where it should be again, because it's it's been disconnected for so long. Yeah, and I, I see your efforts to incorporate our language, you know, in categorization and things of that sort. And that really, when you change the language, it changes the worldview and the way the story gets told. And I think that's probably the uh, the, the the biggest wave that I see happening in the indigenous archaeology is, uh, you know, converting from the use of English language categorization to using our own worldview and our own language. And, and that's something that I've seen you do uh, very successfully. And I'm, you know, looking forward to continuing to support that work, uh, you and Isaac and others that are, are just, you know, breaking ground for so many people. And uh, it's important representation, you know, for our youth, especially, you know, to see, uh, you know, folks like yourself uh, that are doing great things and, and not just in one aspect, but in everything that you do, um, you know, so you bring, uh, you know, your, your culture, uh, your storytelling ability to science, but you also bring it to your art. And, uh, you know, and sometimes in the painting, you, I, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the double curve motif that we often see with Wabanaki art. And I know that you have kind of taken the double curve motif and made it really your own in a lot of ways. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of your design work when it comes to that. Yeah, so the double curve that I use is the protection symbol, the double curve protection. And it looks, um, it's re reminiscent of a, of a woman. It's um, very motherly in the way that it looks. Um, I use those, especially on uh, children's drums, quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think that um, that connects back to that storytelling. Um, so many of our double curves and the stories that are connected with them have been lost. And um, to bring that back, especially through art, to be able to um, teach about the double curves is, um, is important. All right. Thank you so much. I know we gave you a few extra questions than you were expecting. So I wanted to just uh, appreciate uh, all of your time here. And we have a video coming up of you uh, that is pre recorded. And uh, I'm going to allow you to tee it up for us and to sign yourself off before you head out. Thanks. So the video that you're going to see is um, a drum care video. I get so many questions about how to care for drums and how to um, change the sound and um, just any aspect of um, being able to care for it. And I wanna make sure that people know that this is a um, strictly physical care of the drum. And I think I say it in the video, but make sure you talk to your elder about how to spiritually care for your drum. 
All right, and here we go. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. And Luisi, Natalie Daniel Loller, Mujiao, Peskaramukadi, Naga, Panawapskiwi, Dujiao, Madakuk. My name is Natalie Daniel Loller. I am past recording in Penobscot and I am from Indian Township, Maine. I am the proud mother of two boys and one girl and wife of Kyle Loller. I am a drum maker. My okme taught me that music is medicine. Here I'm going to talk about drum care. As you look at some of the drums that I've made in the pictures. Make sure you store your drum in a dry environment. Avoid damp, wet areas. Many people hang them on walls. I don't see a big problem with that as long as they are stored up, not above a heat source in a basement or are left there for long periods of time without usage. If you plan on using them and want to maintain their sound, it's better if you wrap them in a, um, a cloth. Avoid direct sunlight or places that are really hot, like a vehicle in the summer. This could make your drum sound like tight and high-pitched and could cause your drum to split or to warp. Um, you can clean your drum with a damp cloth. Don't use your drum until it's completely dry after that process. When traveling with your drum, it is best to have a drum bag to keep it shielded. If you don't have a drum bag, you can use a small blanket to wrap it up or even a towel. Your drum very much is like our, your own skin. It needs to be moisturized. The easiest way to do this is to use oil from your hands with regular usage. If you notice your drum looking drier, drier than usual, you can use a light coating of bare fat or a plant-based oil like coconut oil or olive oil. Don't oil too often and if you you just need to pay attention to how it sounds and how the hide looks. How often you need to do this step depends on, on where you live and how you're storing your drum. Drums are temperamental with the weather. They don't like being too hot, too cold, or too wet. If it's wet or cold, your drum will sound flat and dull. If this happens, you need to warm and dry your drum. When the weather is hot and humid, your drum will tighten, causing it to sound high-pitched. Be careful of these situations because, like I said, it can cause your drum to warp or even split the hide because it will become too tight. In these cases, put your drum in the shade and spritz with a little bit of water a light mist will do it. And remember to make sure it's completely dry before you use it. That being said, the statement that I just said can also be used to change the tone of your drum to some degree. If it sounds too high pitched, add a spritz of water. If your drum sounds too dull and flat, then slowly heat it up through your own body heat, fire, or other heat sources. Before you use the drum, make sure you warm up the hide. This can be done by running your hand repeatedly on the surface of the drum, placing the drum against your skin, or being very, very careful near a fire or other heat source. Please remember that your drum has the spirit of the tree within it, and the spirit of the animal whose hide it is used to make it. Treat your drum the way you would a baby, paying attention to where you place it, how you store it, how hot or cold it is. If you treat your drum well, you will have it for many years and it will sound amazing for you. Please remember this is strictly how to physically care for your drum. To learn more about drum naming ceremonies or how to smudge your drum or other spiritual aspects of your drum, please reach out to your local tribal elders. Holy One, thank you. Please remember, this is Natalie Dana Lohler's Drum Care Tips. Please remember that there are multiple ways of caring for a drum. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and I hope you take really good care of your drum. Thank you.
everyone. Hi everyone. And Luis. All right, we are back. Thank you, Natalie. That was tremendous. And uh, as somebody that's a singer myself, you can take very good care of your drums. They will last a long time. This one was actually uh, something, a, a drum that I was uh, uh, able to get from a friend of my adopted father, Kenny Merrick Sr. His name was Gordy Favel, living all the way out in Saskatchewan. And this was his personal drum for a long time. It's over 20 years old. And I was uh, uh, able to obtain it from him and I've taken good care of it. And as you can see, it's still got one heck of a good sound to it. But as Natalie was mentioning, you have to take care of it uh, in a physical way and also in a spiritual way. And so uh, the way I was brought, uh, you know, around these drums is that we have to feed them as if they're, uh, you know, they, they have living spirits within them. So we have to feed them. We have to give them water as, as part of our yearly cycle um, and, and to keep that spirit happy. Uh, you know, so there's more to it than, uh, than just, uh, you know, a drum that keeps time as you're making music. There's really something to uh you know uh, the entire uh, aspect of uh, creating music in your instrument and how that's all connected and is even in the vibrations that get created when you mix your voice with the vibration of a drum i want to thank natalie for bringing all of that knowledge and those very very extremely helpful tips uh, for how to take care of your drum uh, that's so important because if you do not take care of them they will uh if in the right condition split uh and uh and that's a sad time when that that happens, you know, uh, that, that uh, the animals uh, that uh, we make these drums from uh, in our belief system uh, give themselves to be part of our lives. Uh, and so therefore, we must honor them by taking care of them properly. So as we are moving on, we're coming up to the uh, next feature artist in our, our, uh, our uh, fifth hour here. And this is artist Randy Smith, Pasmaquati, as well as Hedatta and Mandan. Uh, he works in the mediums of painting and illustration, two-dimensional artist. Uh, and so we love to diversify our arts. Randy, thank you so much for being a part of Digital AMIM this year. He's a new addition to our lineup. And we'll have a pre-recorded uh, presentation from Randy, and then we're going to have Randy join us for some Q&A. Oh, she, she, oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, my, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. We have a new artist this year. Randy is a she, uh, and I apologize for that, Randy. That's uh, totally my fault. Uh, and I was just directed by uh, many people to get that correct. So once again, my apologies, Randy. We are going to queue up your video, and then we're going to go to some Q&A. Hi, my name is Norma. I'm an artist, homesteader, and entrepreneur from Maine. I like to use acrylic and oil paints on stretched canvas, typically on a larger scale, as you can see behind me with my oil painting overlooking Acadia. As a subject, I like to focus on the heritage of both my parents, whom my father is from the Mandan and Hidatsa tribes of North Dakota. And my mother is from the Passamaquoddy people of Zabayag, or Pleasant Point. Both of these backgrounds provide a rich history for learning as well as inspiration. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me at the end with a live Q&A session. Thank you. Unity painting, completed in 2021. This oil painting was a long time in the making and is a continuation of my dancer series that I've made over the years. It measures 36 inches by 48 inches. Once COVID and social distancing had set in, the idea of observing tribal members continuing the traditions of dancing and drumming felt extra special, especially in the uncertainty of how the pandemic was to play out. This specific dance that is being performed in the scene is the round dance, a community dance that has opened everyone to join hands, come together, and garner the feeling of strength, solidarity, and of unity. A nostalgic scene, this depicts fellow Passamaquoddy members during the Indian days in August as they dance to the drum beats in the hot sun, 
lush green surroundings, and the ocean breezes. It is adorned with contemporary Passamaquoddy double curve motifs, my signature spiral portal as an indication and connection to my heritage, and is a mix of realism and painterly style. This will be available for sale on my website. Thanks. The Protectors and Guides from 2021. An oil painting measuring 36 inches by 48 inches. This is based on a dream that I had in a time of self-doubt, uncertainty, and feeling lost. In my dream, I felt like I was in a never-ending rut of a lifestyle, when in danced a strong woman and man in traditional regalia with a group of ancestral support behind them. They were fluid in their movements, sure of themselves, but provided a gentle nudge of guidance that I was where I was supposed to be. A sign of strong medicine, as the male represents a soldier dog from the tribes out west that I come from, who were known as protectors of their people, and to see him meant I was going to be okay. The female dances in her jingle dress, adorned with elk teeth, a belt with a tail, and a f turkey feather fan. Jingle dress dancing has been used as strong medicine for when family members are in need of prayers and help. They dance in front of a bronze spiral portal where the ancestors of protection and guidance wait and support them. You can also see my sigils that I've created specifically for this painting on that spiral that connects me to my ancestors, healing, guidance, and protection, available for sale on my website. Crossing Worlds, an acrylic painting measuring 24 inches by 36 inches. This is another of my dream paintings. My grandmother recently passed away. She was 88 of the Hadatsa and Mandan tribes of the, from the plains out west, and while I wasn't able to be present with her, I do feel like she came to visit me in a dream. The setting is of the main woods and railroad tracks that go on for miles. I'm walking down this road, being out in nature and soaking up the sun, when all of a sudden out walks a female bison and a young calf. Two animals that definitely wouldn't be out in my neck of the woods. They cross my path, stop to stare at me as I stopped and stared at them, and then continued on to the other side of the woods. Seeing as how I don't ever dream of bison, I took this to be a metaphor of my grandma and her son, my dad, who died when I was just a kid, letting me know they're still with me but moving to the other world. She appeared in my dream shortly after she died, and I felt like this was her way of saying goodbye, and it made my heart feel at ease. I will always remember her for her kindness and strength. The scene was hazy, but warm and bright. Poor Wolf, Older, an acrylic painting measuring 36 inches by 48 inches. This painting represents my interest in my heritage and ancestors before me, and is inspired by Edward S. Curtis's photograph of my ancestor. A paternal Hidatsa ancestor from the late 1800s in North Dakota region, Poor Wolf is wearing traditional regalia that he gained and achieved over the years and is representative of his area. He is set upon an abstract background of dark red colors mixed with fiery tones to indicate a blood relative and appears to be coming through a portal, but only half there, as if his spirit energy is wavering and about to be cut off. The portal is lined with sigils that I have created to denote my intentions. Sigils are a symbolic form of communication and intention in the spiritual slash energy realm, using present tense specific and concise words or phrases that one would turn into a symbol after they have matched them up using a number and letter chart and then tracing those numbers on a second number table to create the symbol shape. The beginning of a word on this particular painting is marked with a four-pointed star and ends with an arrow. In this instance, it draws forth inspiration and meaning to the ancestral link with the intentional phrases, I focus on ancestors, connecting, healing through heritage. This painting is for sale on my website as well as prints of this painting. Poor Wolf, Lean Wolf, an acrylic painting measuring 30 inches by 40 inches with a one and a half inch pine frame. This painting represents my interest in my heritage and ancestors before me and is inspired by Charles M. Bell's photograph of my ancestor. A paternal ancestor, my great, 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 great grandfather at a younger age is wearing regalia and set upon an abstract background. He appears ethereal and stoic as onlookers gaze at the difference between us. 
He wears a small breastplate that has hair from fellow community members over a long sleeve ribbon shirt with a bow tie. A Hidatsa Indian from Fort Berthold, North Dakota, Poor Wolf, also called Lean Wolf, lived from 1820 to 1906. He was a survivor of smallpox and a carrier of culture. He was deeply involved in the village and tribal customs, working hard to earn his place as a respected and influential leader. This painting is for sale on their website, as well as limited edition prints of this painting. Poor Wolf in Crow's Breast, an acrylic painting measuring 36 inches by 48 inches. This here is another exploration of my Hidatsa ancestor, Poor Wolf. This painting and coloration of Poor Wolf, who is on the right, and Crow's Breast on the left, is based on a photograph by Stanley J. Morrow around the 1870s. Leaders of the Black Mouth Society, Crow's Breast and Poor Wolf, bought into this police society as a form of managed protection of the camp and community. Set upon an abstract background and depicting their stoicism, they mean business and are not fooling around when it comes to safety. This painting is for sale on my website. Overlooking Acadia. An oil painting measuring three feet by six feet, this painting is seen from the perspective atop of Chick Hill off Route 9 in Clifton, Maine. It overlooks the land before and leading up to the hills of Acadia with the cool autumnal colors and fading summer hues. Up close, you can see the many stippling variations and representations of Maine. This painting is for sale on my website as well as limited edition prints of this painting. Many Calves, an acrylic painting measuring 36 inches by 48 inches. A great, great, great aunt of Hidatsa and Mandan nature from the paternal side of my family. Her nephew married poor Wolf's daughter, Otter Wolf. A female indigenous Hidatsa ancestor of mine portrayed in her beauty, as was her custom and regalia of the time. She is also a focal point for my spiritual and energetic intentions of finding that genetic link and the origins of how I came to this world and how I can use history and ancestry to help shape the person I would like to be. She represents the strong female energy of tribal customs, as women of this tribe were known to have owned their own lodge and were responsible for medicine, farming, hobbies, and taking care of the family. This painting uses sigils as a form of word magic and symbolic representations of what I am trying to manifest, connecting, healing through heritage and ancestors. The tree of life with abstract looking cherry blossoms is on the backside of the portal connecting us while she has come through having been manifested with my sigils. She stands on the red earth, a metaphor for the red road and a reference to the way of life lived by indigenous people always. This painting is for sale on my website as well as limited edition prints of this painting. Hardhorn and Family an acrylic painting measuring three feet by six feet. A great great uncle on my paternal mother's side of family. A look into the distant past and trying to link our connection. According to family clan teachings, they say you are born into your mother's clan and leave through the father's clan. As a person of Hidatsa, Mandan, and Passamaquoddy descent, I tend to find myself focusing on the history and culture of the Mandan and Hidatsa people, where I was also born and lost my father from at a young age. This painting depicts an abstract meeting ground with my ancestors, who have males protecting the grounds and the peoples, and the women who oversee family, growing, medicine, and hobbies. This painting is a continuation of the Sigil series, I Focus on My Ancestors, Connecting and Healing Through Heritage. This painting is for sale on my website. Joseph Sepsa Leaping Deer, an oil painting measuring 24 inches by 30 inches. A Passamaquoddy ancestor born in the 1900s wearing traditional regalia. He is set upon a rich, colorful, abstract background that is worked and woven into his clothing to make him appear ethereal, as well as his blue skin. According to family, he was one of the models for the Indian motorcycle. 
The last couple of paintings that I would like to go over are my smaller paintings that don't require much explanation but are for sale on my website. The first is a spirit animal. An oil painting with an abstract background, this horned owl has been a visitor at my house for a couple of years now. I hear a pair calling at night and have seen it flying over our fields. I pink she blew up. A 16 by 20 black and pink acrylic abstract painting based on the idea of galaxies and star systems being born. Poco Moonshine Lake, an oil landscape, 11 by 14 inches, depicting dusk on the lake. Many Earths, a 9 by 12 acrylic painting, pondering the idea of how we would treat other Earths if we had to move. Space Marbles, a 12 by 16 acrylic abstract space painting. Under the Sea, a 16 by 20 oil painting with, ab with an abstract flower undulating with the ocean currents. All right, we are back. And excuse me while I crawl out of my hole for uh, blowing Randy's introduction there. We're going to be having Randy joining us you know, very shortly here for some Q&A. That was tremendously powerful work there. Uh, I got to say, uh, I'm extremely moved by what I saw. So I can't wait till we can get Randy on. We have some questions for her and I would love. Oh, there she is. Hi, Randy. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? So once again, I apologize for totally blowing your introduction. That was my fault, and I will take full responsibility for that. <laughs> but I will say that it was picked up by a tremendously powerful video of some beautiful artwork. Oh, my goodness. I, I am just blown away by, by uh, the storytelling and the level of artistry that you have. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, so we have questions for you, uh, you know, and uh, the first one I have for you is what drew you to utilizing oil and acrylic paintings as your artistic medium? Well, from a young age, I've always been into drawing. Um, my father was a, an artist as well, and I tend to pick up his abilities. So as I got older, that progressed into more advanced forms of drawing. So that included painting and whatnot. And I love the idea of including different, many different colors that are just all over the spectrum. And so from there, I just, I was also inspired by traditional artists in the sense of like the masters and whatnot. And their form was always oil. So that was my route of inspiration. Yeah, and, and I, I see so much symbology in, in what you're doing. Uh, as somebody that's been out to uh, Menda and Hidatsa, uh, the three affiliated reservation and uh, no folks uh, in that region, a lot of longtime friends from there, um, you know, know how different the cultures are, right? It's, it's a very, very different between Pasquaquadis versus the Plains <clears throat> cultures. Uh, but you incorporate so much symbology and so, uh, you know, uh, there's so much of a story that's being told there. Um, the next question I have for you is really about your advice. Uh, you know, what, what, would, what advice would you have for individuals who are looking to use artwork to connect with their heritage, much like you do, uh, but aren't sure where to begin? Well, um, definitely, I would say start with your parents um, and then proceed there for the grandparents because that's where all the stories come from and um, the intricacies that you can find within those stories that are important and symbolic as well as metaphorical of how we are supposed to live our lives every day. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, when it comes to your style, you know, I, I, you know, I have my own views on it because I've seen different artists, but I'm wondering if you have anybody that, you know, in, that you, uh, uh, you would uh, give credit for influencing your particular painting style. Well, like I said, it was some of the masters out there. Um, I'll break door, I will say, as well as uh, Renoir and just some of the main artists that you would expect that is very inspiring. Um, it's hard to get into because there's just so many. But um, I love the idea of mixing realism with abstract just, uh, just to combine both of those worlds because it's hard to, you don't want to get stuck in full on realism because um, then that's just, I don't know, that's just recreation of what I'm looking into. I want to make sure that I have those expressive forms too. 
um, that, you know, we can all relate to. So we got something coming in from one of our uh, audience members here. First off, some love for you here. Very beautiful way of showing a painting through digital means. Uh, so the, a lot of love for your presentation. Um, and the question is, I wonder how long these paintings are worked on by Randy. So can you talk about the process and how long it takes? Yeah, so um, for this particular painting that's behind me, the, um, the Unity painting, that took me about a little over two years to make. And I will say it was continuously. I did have breaks here and there, but I do spend a lot of time on them, maybe like over 200 plus hours or so. Um, just, it takes a lot of reworking. If I don't like it, um, I'm going for a certain look and a lot of time mixing. You know, I mix a lot of my colors with the primary color. So if I don't get the hue right that matches the face and that's going to take me like 20 to 30 minutes extra just to get just to match it up um which is okay and it challenges me to go further but uh it's um you know it's it takes a bit of time but i try to constantly work on myself to get the painting out quicker and uh, make my style more efficient um so it varies on the painting. My more in-depth paintings take longer time. Some of the other ones I can pump out pretty quick. So, I mean, obviously, you know, just hearing your story and your attention to detail in the process, it comes through in the paintings that, that, that come out for, for sure. And once again, I would encourage everybody, uh, if you want to purchase uh, the items that Randy showed us today, you can follow the link that we have in the chat uh, and go to her profile and that will link you to her website. And uh, I believe according to the video, all of those paintings are on the website. They are all for purchase. Uh, so please support Randy's art. Uh, you know, we're not doing this just for show and education, you know, the way to support these artists is by buying their work if you have the means. And uh, we encourage you to do so. Randy is uh, obviously put a lot of time into her artwork. This is very high level two dimensional art, hoping at some point we can have some of these pieces enter our collection here at the Abbey Museum. For sure. So we are going to be moving on, Randy. I want to just give you the last minute uh, to uh, be able to sign yourself off and say goodbye to everybody. Okay. Well, I just want to say Wooly One to the Abbey Museum for having me, for hosting this event. Um, I look forward to the next year when actually we can be in person. Um, and thank you to everyone who's checking out the, the Abbey Museum event today. I hope you all have a good day. All right, Willie Wood, Randy, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a new artist this year. Ladies and gentlemen, we are up on the last hour of Digital AIM in 2021. Uh, just a little bit of a recap. The last hour, we had a opening presentation uh, that was introduced by Karen Ann Hoffman of the Menominee Players. Uh, beautiful theater work there. And then we announced our uh, competition winners. The People's Choice winner was Jennifer Pictou, Mi'kmaq Nation, and the Artist Choice winner, Monica Jo Raphael, Anishinaabe, Chicago, Lakota. So congratulations to those artists. And we also featured artists Natalie Dana Lolar and Randy Smith, who we were just talking to just now. We are coming up upon the final hour and we are going to be moving into our next set of artists. Coming up in the next hour will be uh, basket maker artists from the Penobscot Nation, Sarah Saka Basin. We also have another new artist to the lineup this year, a uh, new artist to aim him uh, in general, Deborah Brooks, Passamaquoddy Tribe will be joining us. And we have a new performer, Munti Sinqua is gonna be performing a hoop dance presentation. He's filmed a great presentation for us. He's a member of the Sinqua family dance troupe. And uh, hopefully in the upcoming years, when we get back to a live market, maybe we can bring Munti out, get excited for that presentation coming up very, very shortly here. So uh, the uh, like I said, next up is going to be Sarah Sock Basin, Deborah Books, and then Munti Sinqua. We are going to be going into our oh, uh, we need to answer our last trivia question. Uh, 
Uh, our last trivia question was, name one of several prominent Passamaquoddy people who worked with Walter Jesse Fuchs to produce the 1890 wax cylinder recordings. And you could have chosen yeah, either one of these names or both. We will accept them uh, either way. Noel Joseph and Peter Selwar. So either one of those answers were correct. If you gave them both, we'll give you credit for that as well. Uh, once again, we will choose two winners. We will notify them by email. One winner will get an Abbey Museum Indian Market t-shirt, and another will get an enamel pin from our uh, retail shop here at the Abbey Museum. So uh, just a reminder, as we get into our last hour here, that we want to thank our sponsor, Lee Auto Mall. Once again, uh, Lee Auto Mall is the sole sponsor of Digital AMM 2021, and we thank you for their ongoing support. They're the ones that made it possible this year. Also, a reminder, your last reminder that today that if you purchase an Abbey Museum membership for $65, go to our website. If you purchase today, we are going to enter your name into a drawing for one winner of a $250 uh, voucher that you can then use with any artist in the Abbey Museum Indian Market profiles. Choose any artist you wish and you can spend that $250 on them uh, as a thank you, uh, uh, you know, for winning, uh, uh, actually not a thank you, a thank you for uh, becoming a member uh, and also as a prize for one of those lucky people. So a little bit of incentive for you all. Today's a great day to buy your Abbey Museum membership. So we are now going onward to our next artist, Sarah Sockbasin uh, with, from the Penobscot Nation. She is an Ashblint basket maker. Sarah is currently joining us at this moment. And uh, uh, as we go forward, just a reminder that you can always check out all the artist profiles. We have more artists uh, in the artist profile than you did see in all of Digital AMM today. There's no way we could showcase them all. We were only able to feature a handful of them. And there's many more to be seen but sarah you are here however you're sideways i wonder if you can turn your camera oh i thought <laughs> i was supposed to be on landscape there we go yeah for some reason your phone doesn't want to recognize landscape that's all right we'll, <laughs> we'll work we'll work from here with it no problem so uh with that sarah Saka basin uh was here with us last year she's actually one of the board members here at the abbey museum uh it's such a, a a tremendous talent and i'm going to turn it right over to you sarah for your presentation Hello. Well, I am going to disappoint people with uh, my presentation in terms of art, since I don't have very much for inventory these days. However, I do have some fun and exciting projects that are in the works that I've been working on. And so hopefully I can let you know a little bit about what I've been up to. So I do apologize to people who have orders with me and people that are waiting for inventory, waiting for me to have artwork up on my website. I apologize because I have been busy focusing my time with, uh, with the pandemic. I've kind of refocused my attention on some projects that I had been somewhat neglectful to. And so I'm really excited about uh, what I have going on. And actually, this is going to be one of the first times I announce what I have been working on. And soon to come, I'm going to, we're shooting for June. So uh, what I will let you in on is a podcast that I'm working on. And I also have a interview podcast coming up on Makers of Maine. And that's a part of a project that I've been working on with the Maine Crafts Association. So I wanted to kind of give everyone a glimpse into what I've been up to. And hopefully I will be working on baskets again soon so that I can get my orders filled and also have some pictures to post on my webpage. Um, but I also have some other products coming. Um, I don't want to spoil the surprise too much, but I do have some new jewelry and other products coming out soon. So hopefully that will be an exciting thing for people to be able to experience things other than baskets, have a little more product to um, provide a variety 
to everyone that's been waiting for items. So that's what I have going on so far. <laughs> and so if Chris, if you want to uh, switch over to the question and answer, I can do that. Absolutely. I, I mean, it sounds like you're really diversifying. Uh, is this a result of the pandemic or was this a natural uh, movement for you? Uh, well, I think I had a lot of these ideas in my head for years. And basically, when you're doing shows and you're trying to uh, provide inventory and you're constantly trying to fulfill orders and whatnot, you kind of tend to neglect some of those like bigger picture ideas and some of the longer term projects. And so I kind of thought through the pandemic, this would be the perfect opportunity for me to kind of devote some extra time to those projects. And so I'm really loving, you know, working on them. I mean, it's, it's not a substitute for making art at, at all, because that's like really what fulfills me and what I love doing most, but it's kind of fun to do something different. And also I'm really excited to be able to provide something new to people and especially to be able to educate, be able to provide stories and content from other artists and just be able to, yeah, exactly as you said, diversify kind of the things that I'm putting out there. Uh, it's tremendous. And it seems like that that's uh, kind of a running trend with a lot of our artists this year. As a result of the pandemic, we see changes happening, you know, the way they're reflecting the world. And, and uh, you know, that's, uh, I think, being reflected by your story here as well. Um, I got a question for you. Um, you were part of the Maine Arts Commission Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. So what lessons did you learn during uh, the, the, the apprenticeship program that you have held on to as you've established yourself as an award winning basket maker oh uh, well I mean first of all like opportunities like that are really awesome especially when the state and the main arts commission are supportive of native artists and specifically of traditional art so that's a really big deal to have opportunities like that for me to even apply to or tap into and so that really goes a long way in terms of like preserving tradition and helping kind of keep the the knowledge chain going. So just having that um, opportunity was a really big honor. And so I would say initially when I learned, I learned with Jennifer, renowned basket maker, Jennifer Sapiel. She's also Penobscot and a lot of people probably know that. Um, and so when I first started learning, I think, I think the biggest thing when you're starting out is getting a comfortable with your material and the, what we really like focused on what Jennifer instilled in me is your material, preparing your material and, you know, having that respect for the material. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, when they see a finished product, they don't always know all of the steps involved in the process. And that goes as far back as gathering the tree or the sweet grass, uh, gathering the materials, but also the time and labor that goes into processing that. And when you spend time processing that material, you become really, you, you gain a relationship with the material and it becomes like you're one with it. And so initially when I was learning, I, I picked up a lot of the techniques very easily. And I don't know if that was sort of like a generational type of thing with coming from a line of basket makers, but I, I just, the knowledge was, it, it just came very naturally initially, but when it came to Jennifer working with Jennifer, she really instilled, um, that appreciation for the material, for the ash, and stress the importance of how you prepare your material is what will determine the quality of your basket in the end. Yeah, and Karen alluded to that. Karen Ann Hoffman, uh, you know, respect for the materials and, and how you choose them. Use the best materials, she said. And, and, and uh, I hear that reiteration going on right now. Um, so we have another question for you. Uh, you have an unmistakable and unique aesthetic to your basket making. Could you tell us what has influenced your style over the years and how it has changed? 
Well, I really love color. So that's like the first and foremost thing that I focus on. And that really becomes the inspiration from the beginning. So I can be inspired by color, like anywhere I look, you know, whether it's like a landscape and it's the sky, if it's water, you know, natural things, but also kind of more unnatural type of things. I, I'm really very much inspired by my environment. And so those, I feel like those colors come through in my work. And so when it comes to kind of thinking about creating pieces that reflect not only tradition, but also kind of a contemporary, fresh kind of take on something that's, it's blending the old with the new. I really try to be true to who I am as an artist and validate my perspective as a contemporary person, you know, because I think a lot of people get caught up with trying to remain in a time period. And a lot of times when it comes to our art, we as contemporary people are, we have access to our material and we have access to the knowledge, but we also have a modern kind of vision and we have a modern perspective. And I think that's important to showcase that in our work. And so when, my, when I conceptualize and design the pieces initially, I'm really just pulling from my modern experience, but I'm also utilizing knowledge that's been passed from generation to generation and combining that with the ash and natural elements. And so I think it's really, it is reflective of who I am and that's really, I think the it being genuine and authentic is like the most important part. And so I really, when I'm designing pieces, I just, I let them kind of tell me what, how it's going to be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when, when I look at your pieces, you know, one of the things that strikes me and, and you mentioned this just a minute ago, uh, you love color and, uh, you know, I, I oftentimes look at your pieces and I, I feel as if there's a palette, uh, that you prefer. And I wonder if you could talk about, you know, how you choose your colors. Uh, yeah, so I do, I have colors that I prefer, for sure. And uh, also coming from painting, doing paintings and whatnot, that kind of color theory and things like that translates to the dye process really well. So I use a lot of that knowledge, painting knowledge in my work. But I also, um, I, I mean, I think I use a lot of like sky colors. Those are probably my favorite colors. And just, you know, when I capture an image of the sky, like, you know, every day I feel like I, the sky looks different and I can see these colors blending together in a different way. And so a lot of times I think that really is what I'm pulling from is the sky, the color of the sky for the most part. But when I'm picking out my colors, I, I do like vibrant and modern colors and I do use commercial dyes. Um, you know, it would be really nice to be able to stick with natural dyes. That would be really great. But a lot of times they just don't have the vibrancy that I'm looking for. And so I don't really have a problem, you know, using modern materials. And if that is what showcases what I'm going for in terms of the colors. And I also want the colors to, to last as well. And so, yeah, for the most part, I use a lot of bright modern colors but I also I try sometimes to do neutrals as well and just the color of like the cedar and things like that like natural things you see in nature I do try to draw some inspiration when I'm looking for neutrals as well so yeah and uh you know your your commentary on color it, it's uh I, I can remember looking at old uh, department of the interior uh memos about uh Passamaquoddy's and Penobscots and they were sending folks from the federal government to the reservations back in uh, about 1930 and one of the, th the things that ended up in the report was uh, the federal agent reporting that uh, the tribes use commercial dyes uh you know and get bright colors where the federal government felt that we should be using traditional vegetable dyes 
eyes, which are, are not as bright. Uh, you know, so even close to 100 years ago, uh, the basket makers of that time had already made the shift to, uh, you know, the brighter colored commercial dyes. And as we've been talking about with many of the artists today, all of our arts, uh, traditional arts, you know, are born out of tradition taken by the artists and they are dynamic and they do reflect the world as we see it today. Um, and, and so much of that is coming out in, in what you're telling us today here. So um, let's talk about really quickly some of the, um, you know, the, the uh, mechanics of, uh, of basket making, if you will. Um, when it comes to dyeing, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's actually a difficult process. It's, it's not just throwing uh, weavers uh, into a dye. You've got to know the science and, and everything behind it. I wonder if you could speak about that knowledge a little bit. Yeah, so that is definitely a piece that I've like really like gone down the rabbit hole on in a few ways. But I also feel like I've I've had to do a lot of catch up because um, I wish that I had paid more attention in chemistry when I was in high school because that's exactly what it is. It's chemistry, and so I've definitely researched on my own things that maybe I forgot or think that you know, when it comes to applying the chemistry, when it comes to dyeing, um, I, I've had to relearn a lot of that. And, and that's a lot of the modern science that I use in the process. But when it comes to like getting the material prepped, a lot of times what I personally do is I will design a piece beforehand and I will already know the colors I'm going to use. And so when I'm laying out those colors, I decide to every single piece that I prep of the ash, it's actually cut and shaped. And, and it, I almost make a small kit for myself in order to dye. And so I have my different piles of ash all set up. And then when it comes to formulating the colors, I use a variety of different commercial products. So I don't just stick with one brand. Um, I know a lot of the old timers and traditionally a lot of people use the RIT dye and I do use that from time to time, but there's a lot a lot of other textile fiber dyes out there. And so when you start getting into the different products, you also see that there's a lot of different chemistry that you need to know because not all of them are acid based, some of them are alkaline based. And so you really have to kind of understand the way that the fibers will absorb the pigments. And so that that's definitely, um, there's a learning curve there, but at the same time, when you start experimenting and using that chemistry knowledge, you can really formulate some really cool colors. And so that's kind of, I think what reflects a lot in my work is me playing around with chemistry and, you know, formulating different shades just experimentally, you know, and I won't, I usually almost never use um, the color straight out of the bottle. I almost always have to be like a chef in the kitchen and I will literally dye I will take pigments from, you know, the, sh the green family or blue family, put that in my dye pot, and then I will actually test the color. Every single time I add a new pigment, I test the color. I have uh, pieces of scrap ash that I will use to just see where the color's at. And then I'll say, oh, hmm, you know, this needs a little more blue or, you know, just kind of keep testing it. And it's sort of a trial and error kind of process for me. And I like that. It's definitely more time consuming that way. But I feel like I have more control over the exact shade that I ultimately end up with. And that's, that's tremendous for, you know, for you know, especially young uh, up and coming basket makers to understand that, you know, it's more than just assembling the basket. It's, it's about, you know, uh, all the pieces and getting the best materials. It's about knowing, you know, the physics of basketry, right? Uh, the mathematics that go into choosing how many weavers and, and, uh, and also the chemistry that's involved with getting your colors. I mean, there's so much that goes into it and none of it is, you know, pre-manufactured, even though we're using, 
uh, you're using commercial dyes, as you said, you take the color and then you work with it until you add like a chef, you know, to create uh, the final dish uh, in a way, you know, for, uh, um, you know, the, the ingredients that become your piece of art. So I want to say thank you, Sarah, for being with us again uh, here uh, at the uh, Digital Abbey Museum Indian Market. You're such a pleasure to talk to. Uh, and if you would like to see some of Sarah's work, you can follow the link that we have in the chat. Uh, go to our artist profile that will lead you to contact information. And uh, she does take commissions, I believe. Am I correct? Yes, I yep. want to make sure of that <laughs> before I put you out there. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you need to contact her, you can go through the artist profile and uh, get a hold of Sarah and uh, get some of this very high quality work that she does that she's so well known for. And Sarah, we're going to move on to our next artist. And before we do, I just want to give you the last word and allow you to sign yourself off. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And it seems like it's another successful year of Abbey Museum Indian Market digital version. So that's awesome. And I'd like to just say if anyone wants to uh, view more of my work or get in contact with me, the easiest way is to just visit my website, which is sarahsockbeeson.com. And then I also have a new Instagram. So I'm looking to hopefully have some new followers on there and hopefully I'll be announcing so my new projects and products and everything that people have been waiting for. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, Willie won. And we're looking forward to all the new stuff coming out. So thank you so much for being here. Willie won. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in our six. We are up to our final featured artist. I thought I was on. Oh, there we go. I am back. So ladies and gentlemen, we are on in our six. Uh, thank you, Sarah, so much. Uh, we are up to our last featured artist. Uh, once again, uh, there are more artists on uh, for Abbey Museum Indian Market, and you can look at all the artists through their profiles on the Abbey Museum website. Uh, we have a new artist that we were able to add. Uh, she sent her artwork in. Deborah Brooks is going to be uh, giving a presentation. She is passed from Quadi, born in Madoknigo, currently lives in the Southwest. Uh, she uh, works in ash basketry and is the daughter of Mary Gabriel, a very much revered basket maker amongst Passamaquoddy people. We have several of Mary's pieces here at the Abbey Museum as part of our collection. So such a pleasure to have Deborah Brooks joining us here today. And uh, without further ado, here is Deborah Brooks. Hi, this is Deborah Brooks. Thanks for joining me in my presentation on my business, Sweetgrass Basketry, Maine Indian Passamaquoddy, Sweetgrass and Brown Ash Baskets. We've been making baskets professionally for over 23 years, and I love to design and create with texture and color, and I follow the design of traditional baskets, yet I always add a twist of my own unique style in each one. I was born on the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Indian Township, Maine, and I was introduced to basket making early as a child. I have many fond memories of my mother and other family members helping me to learn and understand the art of weaving. This quote is a Wabanaki creation legend. And Glooskab the legendary giant was a transformer culture hero of the people. And the legend reveals how Glooskab provided the people an entrance into this world by shooting arrows into ash trees while the people emerged from the bark of the trees. And this transformation gave birth to wood splint basketry. Weaving handmade baskets of brown ash wood splints and sweetgrass is a very traditional cultural aspect of the Wabanaki people. The brown ash provides structure and substance for the baskets and this particular traditional style basketry has a continuity as basket weavers today continue to create baskets. It's a living cultural tradition. I think the spirit of Glooskop and the basketry lives on in this living tradition of Maine Indian baskets.
Because the harvesting is so labor intensive and requires a lot of muscle, I get my ash from tribal members in Maine who harvest and complete the heavy processing of the ash. The process includes selecting, cutting, hauling the log, peeling the bark, pounding the ash, and peeling the ash strips from the log. The sweetgrass is harvested in summer from main coastal waters, then it's dried in bunches until it's used for braid. And I hand braid all of my sweetgrass. Both unbraided and braided strands are used in the weaving of the baskets. It takes a lot of skill to braid, and it took me a long time to learn how to braid well. When I first started, I always did seemingly everything wrong. It took a lot of many, many hours of trial and error to get it just right. I used a wooden braider that was handed down to me to make the sweetgrass coils so much easier to braid. It saves lots of time and effort. I continue to braid grass often when I'm not weaving with ash, I'm braiding grass. And I have been so fortunate to have been able to work with my mother, who is my mentor. She was an amazing braider. So is my aunt. They could braid so fast. My braiding is much slower, but I'm um, getting faster as time goes on. The braider that I use, fortunately, is a must-have for braiding grass, and I have been fortunate enough to be able to, to get grass, to get enough, to have a good supply. Most of the supplies and materials that I use have been passed down to me from many generations ago. I have tools and gauges. The braider, the wooden braider that I spoke about is pictured here. Also a picture of some of the molds, gauges for sizing the ash strips, and a picture of some of the braided grass when it's finished. I usually coil it in large coils so that I have enough to complete one basket at least at a time. A very popular basket that I make is the collar basket. This is a 9-inch collar basket pictured. They are typically made of braided sweetgrass, primarily. I usually do a design of stripes or some kind. And uh, they, can, they are considered fancy baskets. Um, and they can be colored ash as well as the natural color. And they provide function as well as beauty. They can be used to store items of typically in the um, late 1800s, near the turn of the century, these baskets were used to store men's collars, and that's why they're labeled collar baskets. The traditional sewing flat baskets are an all-time favorite, and they are durable because they are constructed Mine are constructed with heavy standards uh, baseline for the structure of the basket. And they were used uh, originally for sewing items. And they call them flats because they're not quite as tall as the collar baskets. They can be used to store many different items. They would have been very common and popular during the turn of the century. The traditional work basket is shown here in medium as well as large, and it is an all-time favorite also. It's one of my favorite baskets, um, and also the, the important feature of the work basket is that the dome cover is hand-shaped without a mold, which makes it a beautiful, uh, elegant basket to display as well. It would originally have been used in the Victorian times for holding lots of larger items and keeping everything organized in one place. The Curly Q Weave Bowl. This would have been created in the Victorian times as well. The uh, Curly Weave is a very popular weave as well as the color here in blue. It can be made in any color as well as natural. 
and has an amazing ribbon top that gives it just a beautiful design look for any spot in anyone's home and one of my favorites for sure. I really believe that the voice of our ancestors in basket weaving speaks of respect, beauty, and the wisdom of the land. I feel so fortunate to be able to carry on a very old tradition, and tradition not only old, but a tradition that has continuity. It has continued over time, across generations, and the beauty of these baskets just continues to grow and grow, and the popularity as well. I feel really close to my ancestors when I'm making baskets and I respect all of the hard work they went through. I know that I put in a lot of hours in my basket weaving and feel very honored to be able to make these baskets. Thank you so much for viewing my work and I encourage all of you to visit me online to learn more about the baskets that I create and a little history as well. And I encourage you also to reach out with any of your questions. You're important to me and the Heritage Basket today is continually growing and changing and represents a very long tradition of Passamaquoddy culture, of Wabanaki culture that I hope you will appreciate and learn more about. Okay, we're back. Thank you to Deborah Brooks for that fabulous presentation. It's so awesome seeing your, your style of uh, uh, basket making so familiar to me, those uh, braided handles and all of that braided sweetgrass. And uh, I, I remember hearing stories from, uh, you know, people in uh, generations before mine talking about watching their mothers braid sweetgrass and how fast they could do it, you know, but they were doing this sometimes for as little as, as a dime uh, per yard, uh, you know, as they we, uh, were able to weave, but they were so fast at it that, you know, I hear stories of women producing producing up to a thousand yards to a single strand of braided sweetgrass. So, I mean, tremendous uh, talent there. And it does take a while to perfect and, and to see it carried on, you know, that, that style that I'm so familiar with, the Mary and Sylvia, you know, and to see it following with, uh, with Deborah's work. I mean, it's truly inspiring to see. Deborah, thank you so much for being part of the Abbey Museum Indian Market this year. Uh, we do not have Q&A with Deborah this year, unfortunately, but we, uh, she is juried in to next year's Abbey Museum Indian Market. If you would like to see her in person when we go back to a live market next May, she will be one of our invited artists. Thank you, Deborah, for submitting your art and joining us and being part of Digital AMIM 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, we are down to our final performance, and I want to tell you a little story about how this came about here. Munti Sinqua is going to be featured here as our hoop dancer, and Munti uh, is uh, part of a whole family. You know, Munti, Scott, uh, Samson, uh, and others, they, they travel basically the country on the Powwow Trail, and uh, years back, uh, you know, I sing with the Mystic River Singers, but I also sing with Iron River Singers, and uh, the, uh, there's a, a group called the Red Hawk um, uh, uh, Native Arts Council that's uh, located in the state of New York and they put on a few powwows every year and Iron River we were uh, continually invited as one of the co-host drums and many times we we're putting on these full two days powwows uh, full competition you know going all the way into the evening for two days and uh, with only two invited drums sometimes it was it was a lot of singing for for two drums to be able to get through the whole weekend and uh, then these these gentlemen you know that we we didn't see around uh, you know uh, first started to show up in the area and uh, not only were they dancing and, and extremely talented dancers, but they would also set up to sing as wild band. And let me tell you, uh, it was much appreciated that they would bring their music to these powwows and help take some of the singing load. And they did, uh, they did so without ever having a contract, uh, ever uh, guarantee of payment or anything like that. When they were there, they just wanted to sing. And that's the spirit that this family brings to the circle. And, uh, you know, they are all hoop dancers, uh, you know, not just 
Munti, but uh, his son, Scott Sampson. Uh, in fact, uh, the last live uh, World Hoop Dance Championship held at the Herd Museum was in February of 2020. Scott Sinqua, Munti's son, won the World Championship for the adult category. Uh, Sampson came in, I believe, third or fourth that year. Munti also won the senior adult category and is also a world champion from 2020. And they also took part in the virtual uh, hoop dance contest that took place this year with the Herd Museum. So we are so fortunate to be able to bring them to you here to Digital AMIM. I called up Munti. He was more than happy to take part. We have a video of uh, Munti, Scott, and Samson. They're going to be introducing Hoop Dance, talking about the history of it, uh, and telling you a story about its origin. And then there's going to be a performance. And the reason that I chose Munti is because at one of these Red Hawk powwows, we had a Hoop Dance contest. The powwow committee decided to have kind of a spur of the moment Hoop Dance contest. And that included Scott and Samson, Munti and others that were in, in it and Munti was the champion you know so even amongst his younger peers as his sons he was still the champion over them he's one heck of a performer and uh, I'm so blessed uh, that he said yes to being part of Digital AMM this year we look forward to hopefully bringing all of them here live next year so something to look forward to to the live market but without further ado our last performer before we close for the evening Munti Sinqua with Hoop Hello, my name is Munti Sinqua. I come from the Hopi, Tewa, and Choctaw Nations. Our singer today is my son, Samson Six Killer Sinqua. We are honored to share a hoop dance with you. As world touring performing artists, we are grateful to have the opportunity to share our talents with you here at the 2021 Digital Abbey Museum Indian Market. There are many origin stories to the hoop dance, depending on who you're talking to in Indian country. In the Southwest, we believe that it comes from the Taos, New Mexico area. It was a healing dance. Long ago, a little boy would do this dance and his grandfather would sing for him. They say every time he passed his body through the hoop, he was adding a day onto the sick person's life. So many people would visit from miles around to be healed. So still today, we like to take this dance throughout the world because many people do need healing. As we travel throughout the world, we find that as human beings, we are all the same. The only thing that makes us different are our migration patterns. As human beings, we need food, water, and air to exist. And these are only basic needs. We also need love. So I ask you as my human family to please continue to love yourselves and your immediate family members, but also continue to love the plants, the animals, the insects, the air, the water, the earth, everything that the cre Creator has provided for us that allows us to be whatever it is we want to be in this beautiful life. I hope you enjoy. Okwa.
All right. Thank you, Munti Sinqua. We did have a comment in there. Munti from Second Mesa. Absolutely. That was Munti from Second Mesa. Yes. Hopi Tewa and Chakta. Mr. Munti Sinqua, once again, senior adult world champion 2020 from the Herd Museum. Thank you so much, Munti, for that video, for that explanation. That was terrific. So we are in the closing moments of digital AMIM 2021. And I just want to say thank you to uh, all of the artists uh, that were participants, all of the artists that come here for the Abbey Museum Indian Market and make it what it is. I would also like to extend an ex uh, a sincere thank you to the team here at the Abbey Museum uh, who work overtime and have for two years to learn how to put on this event first and then to up the ante in the second year. So thank you to Jill, Joanna, to Lyle, to Zach, and uh, to Star, and to Angela. You mean so much to me. Uh, we could not do this without us working as a team. And it's truly amazing for me to be here working with this team here at the Abbey. They are all special people. And uh, that's my first thank you is to all of them. Uh, we want to thank our competition winners. Jennifer Pictou, who won the People's Choice Award from the Mi'kmaq Nation uh, Artist Choice Award, Monica Jo Raphael, uh, the uh, artist, uh, sorry, excuse me, the, the contest winners from the People's Choice and the Artist Choice Award will uh, actually help decide the aesthetic for next year's logo for our Abbey Museum Indian Market 2022. So it'll be a combination of the work together and it'll create the graphic identity for next year's uh, Abbey Museum Indian Market. Also, a thank you once again to uh, Lee Auto Malls for sponsoring Digital AMM 2021. Uh, they were our sole sponsor this year. We thank them for their ongoing support. They have been such a big part of putting on the Abbey Museum Indian Market. Also a reminder that if you buy a membership today, you don't have to, it, it can go past six o'clock. If it happens today and you buy an Abbey Museum membership, you will be entered into that drawing for a $250 voucher for uh, a uh, to use with one of the artists uh, in the uh, Abbey Museum Indian market profile. So you can choose any artist you want. You can choose any piece of art you want. So that is our prize for uh, for one lucky winner. If you buy your membership today, you still have time today to get that done. Next year's Abbey Museum Indian Market 2022 live next year, May 13th to the 15th. Mark your calendars. The opening night fashion show, all of that starts on May 13th. We will have the live market out on the green here in Bar Harbor on the 14th and 15th of that weekend. We are so excited to see everyone in person next year. We're going to have the return of the fashion show, the return of the film festival, and hopefully an expansion of our art competition. We're looking to grow this market. We're looking to have new artists. We're hopefully going to see the Sinquas here next year. And so that is our, our uh, closing message. We are getting down to it. I want to say personally from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for joining us here today. It has been a tremendous presentation with everybody. I learned so much uh, as I do every year putting on this event. And I'm so thankful for all everybody that contributed. And I'm going to close this year out by saying, first of all, upjuch, which means that I will see you again. So we will be opening this summer here at the Abbey Museum. I'm not announcing the date yet, but we will be open this summer. So hopefully I will see you very, very soon. And I'm going to leave you with a song uh, as uh, this is not a Wabanaki song. I've been a member of the Mystic River Singers. I've been involved with powwow music for a long time. This is actually a song that I just rediscovered. It was made by our late lead singer, Kenny Merrick uh, um, Sr. in 2002. And it's just a, it's a song that he put on my tape recorder. He recorded it one time through and we never actually sang it. And so I was able to find that song. I brought it to the Iron River Singers and uh, we brought it back out and I'm going to finish this year's Digital Abbey Museum Indian Market with a closing song for you all. And then we're going to sign ourselves off. So once again, up judge everybody. I'll see you soon. And here we go. Oh, wait, I got to change a sound setting here so I don't blow anything up. There we go. Okay, here we go.